Hello, uh, we are live with SEO Meetup for August. How exciting. <laughs> we're finally here, guys. Um, we're, it is so awesome to still be able to um, continue to do this online, of course. Um, I, you know, for everyone out there who is facing the, um, you know, the level four restrictions, <laughs> yeah, we are all still working at home and um, you know, the challenges, yeah. I just realized that yeah. I've also got um, the actual YouTube link going on in the background. There we go. Uh, are, you, are, you, are you hearing like an echo of yourself? I am absolutely hearing the echo of myself, but nonetheless, <laughs> I've fixed the issue now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, of course, we are here today to go through um, the, we're continuing the CMS series and I'm so stoked to be able to do this because um, a lot of the time there are, you know, the SEO issue might be like, you know, we've got some duplicate content, mixed content. Um, uh, there might be, you know, things that are a little bit more applicable to different CMSs. Um, and I thought, what better way? Hey, Chris, what better way to kind of go through all of this um, and have a bit of a deep dive with, with, with different CMSs and the pros, cons, challenges, things like that that are very specific um, to different platforms. And I think that this is something a little bit of um, a bit of a gap, if if, if, um, if I'll be so bold to say, in um, out there. And of course, I am bringing on um, two of my very, um, very best friends in the SEO community, if that's okay to say. <laughs> um, but I have so much respect for um, the keynote spe speakers that I have brought on to today. Um, we have um, Peter Machinkovic, who will be deep diving Shopify SEO, and of course, um, the illustrious Tony McCreeth, who will be deep diving um, big commerce. Howdy, howdy, guys. How are you doing? Hey, Nick. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, Tony, you are based in Adelaide, um, so you're not dealing with some of the issues that we have here in Melbourne. Um, but you know, it's all, it's an absolute honour to have you on. You're an absolute titan in um, you know for Australian SEO um, and the world at large. How um, you know how are you guys going um, in Adelaide? Uh, Adelaide's doing pretty good. We've got two active cases at the moment, so not much of a panic there. Uh, but it's going to be a while before I can come and uh, get to one of your meetups for real again. <laughs> I've been yeah, to a few, I think so. They were great. So. Uh, can't wait till things uh, calm down over at your side. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we're, so, we're sorry for misbehaving so badly. Not <laughs> I know we're a bit like the problem child. <laughs> yeah. But um, for anyone on the chat who isn't aware, um, Tony is um, also the. Um, he has built um, Classy Schema, which is a fantastic structured data um, tool that will be able to show you what's going on with your sites, um, which is now coming, um, uh, is kind of like coming into the bit of a the foray for me, because um, of course the structured data testing tool as we know it is um, no longer here and um, being replaced with the rich snippet tool. Um, you know, it's 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 what Google has decreed us to do, um, but that is a fantastic place, um, a fantastic website to check out um, to be able to have a look. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we need to talk about Lightbulb as well, which is just yeah. brought out. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah so so yeah, I was going to say Sitebob released their version four, and with it, uh, Patrick and the team at Sitebob released their structured data testing thing. And we just literally during our pre-launch had a quick test of it. Uh, Tony and I had a look at different pages that we knew, and it's actually pretty good. Uh, probably some still kinks to work out, but Sitebob do good work. I'm really, really happy that a lot of these people in the SEO community are responding to Google not picking up the ball and actually building these tools that are great. Because uh, Tony and I are on the same mailing list, I guess, or the same Google group where we talk about schema stuff. And there's a lot of discussion when this happened of like, how are we going to build like a new tool? Like Greg Kellogg said, well, I have this tool, but it's like, mm. you don't want to pay for hosting. It's all that kind of stuff. And other people's like, so yeah, seeing these tools being built by the SEO community to help us do this kind of stuff is really exciting. 100%. Um, yeah. And of course, like the the rich of it, um, test, like tool, like it's just not the same because of course, like the structured data testing tool, you'll actually be able to see where um, where the issues are occurring, um, and it's pretty transparent at um, being able to debug this stuff. So um, yeah, it's just 
yeah, any 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 opportunity to be able to like showcase something um, or like a good alternative, whether it be class of schema, whether it be um, site bulb, um, is awesome. Yeah, um, <laughs> Peter, Peter, um, I think a lot of a lot of you out there in um, in a little community bubble um, know about him. He is usually um, the illustrious commenter in um, in the live chat, um, and is always a source of um, some fantastic information for me and a lot of other um, SEOs here in Australia. And I'm just absolutely stoked to have you on, particularly to talk about Shopify SEO. Um, and kind of have the, have this here as like a bit of a resource for people to kind of refer back to in the future. Um, so Peter, how have you do, been doing? Oh, um, I had a COVID test today. So yeah, I've been better. So yeah, <laughs> sick the last couple of days, but yeah, like, you know, I'm dealing, you know, these lockdowns are kind of tough because it means, you know, I don't get to see my dad anymore, that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, you have to, we have to stay in our houses and all that kind of stuff. And it's really, really, really tough on us Victorians. But, you know, as long as we have, like, you know, our co-workers that we can talk to, our friends, you know, our support network, that's pretty, really good. Uh, from an SEO standpoint, um, been busier than ever, uh, mainly because, you know, in COVID times, we just had so many meetings because everyone can, like, have a meeting all of a sudden. So, yay, it's been busy, busy, busy. But, yeah, working on some exciting things. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely agree. Um, and, of course, like, you know, with working from home, um, there's all kinds of, of stuff you know, <laughs> that we have to kind of um, take account for, you know, being busier um, and, you know, just kind of like the life stuff happens and, you know, we've got children, I don't have children, but I've got dog <laughs> um, who always likes to make a bit of a cameo um, <laughs> on, you know, whether it be a client call, whether it be on the SEO meetup. Yeah, there's a lot to kind of take into consideration. Um, and by the way, well done, um, well, you know, well done and just being responsible and you know, getting getting this um, yourself checked and tested and of course like trying to make sure that you're being as safe as possible um, yeah it's definitely a challenging time at the moment yeah we all have our responsibilities and we can contribute in little ways and getting tested is one of the ways we can contribute to help beat this thing so yeah so everyone get if you don't just get tested all the time because it's a long time to wait mm -hmm. it's very cold in the morning but if you do feel symptoms or if you know, have a known contact of someone who has covid um please get tested um yeah yeah Thanks, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, before we get into it, I've, um, I'll have Tony uh, do his presentation first, but before we get into it, like um, over the past month, have you sort of seen anything um, really, really interesting um, as far as like, you know, seen any featured snippets, like changes, like there's always SERP changes, like anything of note um, in the last month that uh, you'd like to talk yes. about? Yes, I have. I've noticed that some product listing pages, so collection pages, are starting to have the review schema show up if you have products marked up. And I haven't been able to replicate this on scale. Like I know, like off the top of my head, I have like probably three URLs or three keywords I know I can search, I can bring it up for a particular client of ours, mm. but I can't replicate it for other clients because I have other clients who have, who have better markup a better schema that like, technically this is a bug is like oh those products shouldn't have a schema it's just like this particular template had it in there and it wasn't removed but it's like oh that's not supposed to happen anymore so i'm actually looking at that but i don't know if that's related to like google providing new guidelines on how to do like arrays or multiple items and stuff uh, there's also a new product group schema so i don't know if there's like an opportunity for that to happen again, but I need to see more of that in a live environment. But I have noticed it with one of our clients that's been showing up. And it's really interesting because I want to replicate it like on that's scale. Awesome. That's super <laughs> interesting. Greg, yeah. um, particularly with product schema, um, you know, always like want to keep a close eye on it because if there's any errors or something like that, like pretty much everything kind of goes down. <laughs> um, like, yeah. you know, there's an issue or an error that pops up um, with reviews, like they'll kind of like just stop be generating. So that's really, really interesting. Yeah, I'll probably send a screenshot. Probably next time we have DMU, I'll probably show it to you internally. Uh, for those of you who are playing, <laughs> maybe we'll talk about it in another meetup. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Um, uh, Tony, um, like you've been tweeting a lot about um, Chrome. Well, you, I say a lot. You've said one tweet about Chrome 85. So I'm going to use oh, that right. as a segue because that's kind of the thing that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> it's right. I was like, like you know, developments and things like that um, over the course of um, the month. Um, yeah, you, you've been seeing that popping up in your GA. 
Uh, yeah, so I, I track, I basically got a, a bot checker that sends data to Google Analytics for fun. Uh, and it, it gives me an alert when the new Chrome version comes out. So uh, definitely it's, it's this week has been ramping up on uh, Chrome 85. Yeah. And, uh, so I'll put Chrome 86 on my alerts now. <laughs> Awesome. Um, for anyone who's um, not not up with with it, I mean, fair enough, because I think um, the Google Webmaster, uh, the Google Developer blog, kind of kind of only recently um, posted this. I think of July thirty first, but um, yeah, like it's really it's really important to kind of like just be aware that Chrome eighty five is now um, very much live, and as we've already um, been able to hear from Tony, he's starting to pick it up that um, that we're, we're seeing this. Um, you know, being used in um, being able to go through and uh, look in at sites. Um, but it's, you know, it's really important to know for tracking. So um, whenever you're looking at data from Google Analytics, um, you know, which use referrer for distinguishing between traffic sources, um, what it'll actually do is like it'll strip the referrer string to origin only. So say mm -hmm. for example, you've got like, um, like example.com and like, you know, example path, um, like it will only kind of go to like, just like to the origin only. So just like example.com. Um, so it's good to know when, especially like in, when navigating across um, different origin URLs. Um, I like, I might, I might actually like put, um, I'll find, I'll find the, the, um, the links and put them in the in the description or I'll put them in the comments. Um, but it's one that's, um, yeah, there's like, I think like four new updates um, right about um, Chrome 85 and um, things specifically that's happened over the course of July. So yeah, I think, um, yeah, it will, it will be a little bit harder to figure out the attribution. <laughs> Cause I think, um, you know, like with all these changes and things like that, I think it's um, with privacy in mind, um, you know, to be able to protect, um, protect like user privacy and things like that. But of course, like whenever those, they do that kind of things, like us SEOs are like, come on, that's a bit of a loss for us for analytics insights. Um, <laughs> like maybe we might have to like resort to like some UTM parameters or something like that um, as a bit of a workaround. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of like something that I wanted to just kind of touch base and geek on. Um, have you seen any of those things pop up, Peter? Uh, not really, but I've, I've been too busy this month to look at analytics or anything. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's stuff you have to actually keep an eye on. Because like referral strings, like for example, if you have subdomain, subdomain tracking, those kind of things, um, it can become a big problem if you're not getting all the data. Especially if you have like secure and non-secure websites as well. Like non-secure and linking to secure, yeah. I think is a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think um, yeah, I don't know. I don't really have all that much because I think, you know, like everybody else. I'm kind of taking a bit of TLC time for, for and some me time, um, but also just kind of like really just trying to focus on um, some getting through some good client work. So uh, I don't really have that much news to report, which is where Sideo George, uh, who is um, who does a TDLR marketing, um, like, you know, is, is so useful for <laughs> to be able to lean on him to be able to pull out some news. But I think this is a really good segue to now look at um, big commerce SEO. Um, Tony, are you are you happy to start presenting? Uh, yep, I'm good. Uh, if you share the screen. Bada bing, bada boom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take it away, Tony. And of course, to everyone um, who's just joined on, um, this is Tony McCreeth. He will be going through Big Commerce SEO, which I'm so excited to, to have him on to do. If you have any questions, pop them in the live chat. I will be um, monitoring all of that um, and maybe even like popping out a couple of people. Shout out to Gaston Riera, who's um, an absolute titan in our community. Yeah. Um, so yeah, got some questions. Um, I will be posting them in there internally. All right, take it away, Tony. I got to remember to start my clock. Uh, right, so uh, big commerce SEO. Uh, oh, first I'll uh, the reason I'm doing big commerce SEO is I've been working on the big commerce flat platform for almost ten years now, uh, doing SEO, and uh, my company, Website Vantage, uh, do some. Uh, we have a set of packages that we do all related to SEO uh, in that area. 
so it makes sense for me to talk about it. Uh, I thought it'd be good to do a bit of a kind of intro on what big commerce is. Uh, so it's it's online shopping. It's an e-commerce platform, and it's classed as a software as a service platform. And this is the same as Shopify. So that the two are quite similar in uh, the sort of features and how they work. Uh, what it basically means is you get everything in one box. It's a it's a one stop. Uh, it, the whole shopping system is provided in one go. So it's got the hosting, your certificates, SSL certificates, uh, uh, loads of features built in from the beginning, all to do with shopping. Um, and all this is uh, so big commerce starts at about thirty dollars a month. Probably Shopify is similar. Uh, and uh, you can basically, within 10, 10 minutes, you could have a store up and running uh, that's a fully a fully functional store. Obviously, it takes a lot longer if you, uh, uh, you've you got to put your products in there, decide your shipping and your payments, and, uh, and design it. Uh, but uh, basically, because it's this one-stop shop, everything is built in, functional, and so it's very quick to to get a pretty solid, low maintenance, uh, feature rich shopping system up very quickly. Uh, on the on the slide there, you'll see. Uh, well, it might be a bit small, but uh, it, they they they've got a four step wizard to getting your shop up and running. Uh, so that's basically what Big Commerce and Shopify are. And so a lot of features underneath will be similar. Uh, Whereas, say, WooCommerce is a bit more like uh, you're building your own kit car. You, uh, uh, you've, you've got to pop, bit, bring all the parts together yourself uh, to, uh, to make it work. And that means you've got a lot more flexibility. But at the same time, you, you're going to have more maintenance issues. You're going to need a, a developer to fix problems, things like that. Uh, so there's a kind of uh, big commerce Shopify is fast out there, feature rich, but s slightly limited, something like WordPress, WooCommerce, Magento, uh, you're, it's going to take longer to get a thing working, but you have a lot more flexibility, loads of plugins, things like that. Uh, right, let's get into the actual SEO side of big commerce. Uh, so the, the first thing uh, you'll, you'll be doing is your, your basic store settings. Uh, and here's a little plug for something I've done. I've got a big commerce SEO helper Chrome extension, and it basically just adds you a Google preview to whenever you're doing your title tags and meta descriptions. Uh, so that can help you do your SEO bits and see what see what's going on. Uh, so in the store settings, you've uh, you can set the homepage title. And you can set a meta description, which becomes the default for any page you've not bothered setting one for. So I highly recommend you, you can set meta descriptions for almost every page. So go through. Don't forget to do it. That's always the bit that, get, that gets forgotten with SEO, uh, title tags, meta descriptions. Uh, you get to cho choose if you want dub, 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 dub or not for your domain. Uh, that's uh, a pretty standard approach. You. Uh, stick to what you had before. Uh, if you're not sure, go into Google Search Console, verify them all in there, and see which one Google has chosen and uh, set that there. Uh, you're already secure. Uh, the You plug it in and you're HTTPS from the go. You got a certificate. Uh, I believe you can uh, pay for more expensive certificate. Robots text file. Uh, this, I'd say, just don't touch it. Uh, if you're going to touch it at all, you can put uh, a sitemap in there. Uh, but uh, the standard settings uh, are uh, perfect. Well, great for for a normal website. Uh, maybe if your website is uh, 10, 50,000 pages, you might want to start playing with with this to uh, uh, to deal with things like faceted navigation and uh, whether you've switched that on and whether it's a custom one, things like that. Uh, but generally, you can just leave that as is. Uh, interestingly, Big Commerce doesn't use robots meta tags at all, so it doesn't do no indexing. Uh, they do they uh, block the bot from via robots text, so they basically say don't crawl. 
rather than don't index. Uh, it's I'm guessing it might be just saving on server resources. Uh, so that's your basic store settings. Pretty much very simple. Follow the fields and you're there. Uh, right. That, another one is if you if you're doing a migration. Uh, it supports uh, it redirects. There's a whole section on redirects. It's, it's a bit of a clunky interface, but uh, you can export to a spreadsheet, add redirects, and then import back in, which uh, a lot of people do, especially with the migration. Uh, there's also uh, APIs, and I know at least one app that can help you manage your redirects. Uh, it, it has a, a few systems. You can do manual URL to URL. Dynamic is... Uh, you can specify, say, a specific product. And if that product moves, the redirect updates automatically. Uh, so the, the redirects are there. You, uh, you can add tens of thousands. It seems to have no kind of limit on, on how far you can go there. Uh, but one downside is it's always a one-to-one -one redirect. There's no wildcard thing that you can set up. So it's probably down to uh, a lot of work in a spreadsheet to get, get everything up and running. Uh, related to that is the URL structure. Uh, this is another section that I'd say uh, do not touch it unless you have to. Uh, by default, uh, it gives short SEO URLs, and uh, so they, it's got nice keywords in it, and uh, they're short. You can change to long, uh, and that effectively adds things like a category path to a product. But uh, unless you've got a compelling reason, that can it adds more possible uh, disasters. If you change the URL for a category, you change the URL for every product in that category, things like that. Uh, but you might have, you might want to try and uh, mimic the structure of your previous website, uh, and so you can do a fully custom. Say, say if your previous website uh, has a products folder for all your products, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's flexible enough, but uh, if you, I, I recommend trying to avoid uh, altering this, especially once you've gone live, because you you just start messing with the bots and things. Uh, and on a related thing here, uh, the canonical tag is automatic, uh, so every page has a valid canonical tag. Uh, and watch out uh, if you're doing out of stock products, because there is a setting that makes them completely disappear. They, they 404, and you don't want to do that. Uh, so uh, there's just a bit of a heads up on uh, on, on that particular gotcha. Uh, so the main thing, the, uh, the SEO side of, of, the, of the website is just the content that you put in. So you can add content to all the standard e-commerce pages, home, product, category, brand, page, and blog. You can do title tags and meta descriptions. And my uh, Chrome extension will give you that preview. Uh, it automatically creates URLs uh, for you with uh, keywords in them. Uh, and one little uh, keep an eye out for is if you change things like a product name, it will try and change the URL on you. Uh, it does create a redirect. Uh, but I personally think it's best not to constantly change uh, uh, URLs like that, uh, especially you can get into cases where you, you get circular redirects because so many times you've changed the name. Uh, you can, uh, for, for images, uh, so for products, they call it description of the image, and that's your alt attribute. Uh, and you can also do the alt attributes in uh, in your, uh, in the HTML editor uh, or the WYSIWYG editor that you've got. Uh, the, the, actually, the only, so all of them you can do an introductory page uh, content, uh, apart from brand, which is a bit weird. There's, they've never given you the ability to actually put some content on a brand page. Uh, but there is a trick. You basically, uh, you create a, uh, a banner uh, for the brand page and the banner can contain content. Uh, so there's a little bit of a hack there. Uh, and uh, hopefully one day they'll catch up with that one. Uh, so you've got your content. You've got your basic SEO, your title tags and things. Uh, so uh, it's that, uh, you can design the website uh, to make it pretty uh, and make it branded. Uh, so 
uh, big commerce follows uh, the standard type of uh, theme thing with template files. Uh, it's uh, their systems called stencil and uh, the language you can do inside the templates is called handlebars. Uh, and their latest stencil uh, theme, uh, Cornerstone is their standard theme that every, everybody works from. Uh, and that has some nicely built in things like it bundles your JavaScript, it minifies it, things like that. It, images are, uh, they have the source set added to them. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this will be the next slide. Uh, oh, yeah, I uh, almost missed. Uh, you can actually have big commerce as a back end and WordPress as the front end. It's an API. I think it's it's still in its infancy, but if you want the power of WordPress with the stability of a, an e-commerce platform like big commerce, you can actually do that now. Uh, so speed is a big thing. Uh, this year, uh, I think, well, probably next year, Google is going to use the Core Web Vitals as a ranking factor. Uh, how much, I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, the speed of a website, not only for Google, but just for user experience is important. And BigCommerce does some uh, pretty good standard stuff. Uh, so it's it's got a CDN for all the images and resources. They use the Akami, Akamai uh, Image Optimizer so your images are compressed uh, nicely and uh, a modern theme will actually resize the images to fit the, uh, the, the way it's displayed. So uh, that can work really nice when, uh, when the theme's up to date. Uh, also, modern themes use image lazy loading. Uh, that's typically via the JavaScript method, but uh, soon uh, it's going to be built into browsers, which uh, is nice. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the theme will uh, bundle and minify your JavaScript and CSS. So that basically just means instead of 20 JavaScript files that have got full of spaces, it all gets put into one JavaScript file that's uh, crunched up, uh, meaning uh, there's less uh, res resource intense uh, activity going on as a page is loading. Uh, the they also offer uh, a limited AMP support for product and category pages. Uh, at, I'm not too keen on using it. Uh, we just keep seeing little glitchy things going on, and it means an alternate theme uh, and template files. So uh, unless your website is very uh, AMP, uh, also mobile search result based, uh, I'd recommend maybe not putting that on or just testing it. Uh, and BigCommerce does the hosting for you. So you, you, you're getting something a bit more than a $5 a month server. Uh, and actually, the next slide will give you a bit of a clue on the, the speed. Uh, so this is, this is the Chrome per performance report. Uh, so if you go into... Uh, the Chrome developer tools, and you can do a performance tab, do a refresh, and it will tell you uh, uh, all the requests that are made, how long they're taking, whether they're in parallel or not. Uh, so this, I thought uh, uh, it'd be a good idea to do uh, a default theme, simple page that's just a bit of text content to give you an idea of how pretty good BigCommerce is at, uh, at rendering a page for you. or, or serving a page to you. Uh, so you'll see here the long blue line is is actually the, the initial request uh, to the server to get the HTML. And this, uh, that's, that's I'd say that's quite large. In fact, you can see it's a large proportion of the actual total time for the page. I think that's partially because I'm in Australia and uh, their servers are probably in the, is in the States. Uh, so that, that took, takes about half a second of effectively a blank page. But then it kicks in really well. The, the, the five uh, parallel lines, that's all the resources. That's all the resources loaded for the page. So one CSS, there's a font, uh, and I think there's two JavaScript files. And so once the page is there, it gets... Uh, executed very quickly. 
In, in fact, that long, the longer one, the purple one, uh, along with the little green blob afterwards, that's a font. So the slowest part of this page, once it's been there, uh, the HTML has been returned, is loading a font. So that shows how the, the other resources have made, uh, it's, it's not important. They're so fast. Uh, and this is also without any caching. So uh, this is like the worst case scenario of uh, someone's never been to a website before. Uh, and so I've highlighted a couple of the important uh, things that are going to be in the uh, Google's uh, analysis. So LCP is largest contentful paint. And that's going to be their measure of uh, how fast until a person gets a usable, uh, gets to see the website. Uh, so that in this case, it's just a just under a second. And the major part is that initial HTML. Uh, so the time to first byte, TTFB, is the critical path on this, this particular scenario. Uh, another measure is CLS cumulative layout shift, which I pointed out at the bottom. And that's basically if the page moves a bit as it's being put together. And so in this case, there was a little bit of a, a, a movement. Uh, uh, once uh, maybe an image appeared that wasn't quite the size. Uh, so, But this scenario shows a pretty good result for a page. Again, this is a very simple page. Uh, I can point out some, uh, uh, I guess, examples that I think with every website you will find that these scores go down. Uh, one we find is the carousel on the home page, uh, because that introduces a whole bunch of large images that move. So you not only have a delayed uh, first uh, largest contentful paint because it's got to load those images, but then the images move and it causes a CLS on you. <laughs> Uh, so car homepage carousels, uh, there's an argument about them or not anyhow, but it's another reason why maybe not. Uh, obviously, if you add features to the page, uh, so if you do widgets like, say, a chat bot in the corner, uh, it's going to slow things down. And again, like most pages, will have images in them. So if, if you uh, say your homepage has 30 products listed, that's obviously going to slow things down a bit, but you've got lazy loading of images and optimized images, so it, it does it as well as it can. Uh, so I think pretty much for big commerce, it does really well on on the potential speed. Uh, it'd be just nicer if they had a faster server in Australia. Uh, all right. Ah, now this is the promo thing. So one of the major areas that we do work in is the structured data for big commerce. Uh, it's our main main product, and people have been wanting to get those review stars for forever, and they still do. And uh, the built-in themes tend to be a bit hit and miss. Uh, so most themes have product and review markup built in, but they make a few mistakes. And what we've found is sometimes it, it works, you get your rich results, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so we've always been in business to get those review stars to work. And a couple of months ago, we actually uh, released an app to do this. So instead of manually creating it, we uh, people can now press a button and have their structured data all fixed up in one go. Uh, and so a few things that are, I guess, the basic big commerce can't deal with, uh, but our app can, uh, is uh, it it doesn't know how to deal with third-party review systems. It just knows how to deal with the built-in reviews. So you tend to get completely disjointed structured data, if at all, for your reviews. Uh, whereas we've uh, developed to, for the four listed there, we've we've developed a way to integrate uh, those so that you will get review stars and price. The problem with disjointed is Google kind of goes, I'll give you one, but not the other, that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, product reviews is the standard one, but uh, we decided to go a bit further, and this is where the classy schema thing came in. Actually, uh, we decided to do FAQ page and how tos and videos, and we realised that that was a bit too hard for your average Joe to place that uh, structured data on the website, and to make it worse, big commerce is. Uh, HTML WYSIWYG editor 
stripped out structured data. So uh, it's they made it very hard to add your own custom structured data. So we, we developed the classy schema system, uh, which includes editors and combined with our app, uh, you can actually get structured data for all those types in in the pages. And you'll see in the example we got there of the FAQ rich result. And this is actually a client of ours from Sydney who sells or delivers cakes. Uh, we also got into emojis. And again, Classy Schema has an emoji thing. And again, big commerce, you can't enter emojis into the editor. Uh, in fact, if you enter the wrong emoji, uh, it will strip out all the content after the emoji. So be be careful if you're going to try and do emojis on your own. Uh, so we developed a system again, again needing, uh, uh, well, the code's on the uh, Classic Schema website, but the app auto installs it for you. So we've, come, we've gone a lot further on basically the structured data you can do uh, and the rich snippets you can get. Uh, I, other things like you can actually customize how you want your products to be marked up. You can specify that you're an organization or a local business or a store. Uh, a whole bunch of extra bits and things that we we take things to the next level. Uh, right. So I'll, going on a different angle, SEOs want to be able to track stuff. And Big Commerce has got a, a pretty good built-in uh, system for some of the core things. So, so you, you got uh, their own analytics reports, and I think they get better as you pay more. Uh, you can uh, set up uh, Google Analytics enhanced e-commerce in basically, well, the screenshot shows you there. You just put in your code. Uh, you have to go into Google Analytics and switch it on. And uh, the, in fact, that link there will show you the full steps to uh, to get your enhanced e-commerce. And so I think that's very similar to Shopify. I think I think that has a, a very simple way to get enhanced e-commerce. Whereas say you're on WordPress, you would have to install a plugin and play about with this, that, the other. So th this is a good example of how the software as a service systems can make certain things just so easy to uh, to get up and running. Uh, Facebook Pixel is you just put in your uh, account ID and it puts the pixel in for you. Uh, and I believe that includes like conversion tracking, that sort of thing. Uh, and they've got a, you can put a verification tags in like your Google Search Console and Bing. Uh, and you can also verify uh, Google via uh, if I actually, that's the, another slide, <laughs> getting ahead of myself. Uh, right, so that uh, those were the kind of automatic uh, kind of tagging and pixeling. Uh, you can also uh, add your own uh, scripts via the scripts manager. So this is a nice little way to keep yourself organized. It's, it's a bit like Google Tag Manager that you can you create little tags and you name them. And uh, it's a lot simpler, uh, not nowhere near the amount of features. Uh, but it means you can uh, you can either reference a script in this organized place uh, or embed scripts actually on the page without having to play with the uh, theme, which is good. Because uh, the, there are cases where it's quite hard to manage theme files, uh, template files. And if you're starting to put in script tags here and there and everywhere, you can never find them and things like that. Whereas this is in a separated out. If you change theme, you don't lose your scripts, that sort of stuff. Uh, so th this is quite a nice thing. And it's also uh, uh, apps can add their own scripts to the script manager. So if you install an app, you, it might, uh, you'll see it show up with a, uh, a, its own little script tag uh, to show it. And that's what our app does the same thing. Uh, so, yeah, that's useful stuff. Google Search Console. I knew I had it later. Um, so you can verify via domain. Uh, you've, you've actually got control of DNS settings within the big commerce admin. Uh, so you can do a domain level verification and a few other things that you want to do. Uh, I think common ones are like setting up emails, that sort of thing. Uh, the other way is the thing I showed earlier is you can just put in your, your tags uh, into the uh, special uh, verification section. And I always recommend uh, put all of all four variants in uh, with or without WWW uh, 
uh, HTTP, HTTPS, uh, like I've got with the classy schema example there. Uh, and everybody knows Google Search Console is uh, a very important SEO tool. Uh, you can you can add your XML sitemap. So BigCommerce has a sitemap, just the one, and it only has 50, up to 50,000 URLs. So that is a bit limited. Uh, it'd be nice to see if any uh, anybody comes up with a, a more powerful one, uh, but it's not a game changer. Uh, I, I've actually, once, you, you can upload files, and for one client who had uh, 500,000 products, uh, and a lot of an in indexing issues. I actually up, uh, created and uploaded uh, a whole set of custom sitemaps just to see if I could work out where the problems were lying. Uh, so, but I don't need to go into Google Search Console and teach you that. That's a, a general uh, area. Uh, you can uh, view your structured data there, both in uh, how it's showing and ranking and whether it's valid, that sort of thing. Uh, right. So. It's not perfect. And I've mentioned a few of the limitations already. Uh, so the uh, I mentioned no emojis in content. We fixed that. No microdata or JSON-LD in content. Uh, we've, we've fixed that. The brand page I mentioned, so you, you add banners. It's a bit hacky. You might need to change your theme around a little bit. But there's a solution. Uh, there's no direct control over meta robots tags, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, 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 they they don't get into that sort of stuff. Uh, you can hack into it. It's a bit nasty because uh, you're doing weird themey template file changes. Uh, uh, but out of the box, uh, it's not really an issue you want. Same with the uh, canonical tags. I've I've had people say, I want to edit my canonical tags to kind of have one page canonical to another. And uh, not that easy. Uh, you can hack it. 99% uh, of people do not need to do it and shouldn't do it. Uh, and another area that could be a limitation uh, is all the images and resources are stored in the CDN, and you can't do redirects on the CDN side. You can only do redirects on your own website. So uh, probably not an issue, uh, but you've got, I guess, if, you, if you've changed image file names and things like that, they're going to have to kind of start again uh, from scratch in their ranking ability. Uh, so I think that covers it. Uh, as a conclusion, I'd say that there's with big commerce, there's a lot you don't have to worry about. You can. A whole bunch of those slides there are pretty much do not touch anything. Uh, so you, you can go straight to focusing on getting your content right and working on the business features rather than getting the website to work, which is great. Uh, and that's my case for big commerce. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, and I'm very active in the big commerce community, which is a great place to uh, uh, ask questions about uh, big commerce and how things work. Thank you so much. That was utterly incredible. <laughs> oh wow! I just I'm just still kind of like downloading. I think things that you had said like you know at, at the twenty percent mark. That was just chock full of fantastic information. Oh, actually, and uh, there's a link. Thank there. you so much. Uh, the slides are all on SlideShare, and you can also see my uh, my notes in there as well. So uh, hopefully that's uh, if I was a bit too quick. Uh, you can uh, you can go in there and uh, and and get the information from that, and I can't believe it. Exactly half an hour. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> I love I love that you like were, kept the time in mind, but you know, <laughs> I really wanted to like make sure that we were giving um, a good proper amount of time. So that's why I've had a bit of a different um, structure to the SEO minute but that's um that just means that we've got some really great um time for some questions um so i might just start off with the one from gaston um i think both peter and i have got our own questions for you that we've been um posting in the private chat here um but um yeah so gaston riera asks tony you mentioned that errors happen if you enter the wrong emoji is it referred to the unicode or errors in the big commerce code also um, 
can you refer us to a resource about emojis mm -hmm. on e-commerce? <laughs> now, um, <laughs> you know, if you do follow Tony on Twitter, um, you'll you'll know that this is actually being this is actually possible. Um, so I think we just kind of like want to know uh, a little bit of your secret yeah, magic. Yeah, so here. it's right. It's not just emojis. <laughs> actually, it's. Uh, uh, Basically, you can now have characters that are more than your normal character length, and they effectively become multiple characters that piggyback off each other, and that's what emojis do. Uh, so they're, they're more than, uh, uh, what is it? F, 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 <laughs> something like that. Uh, and for some reason, yeah. the big commerce back end uh, doesn't, can't deal with those, that sort of Unicode and it just chops off the content when it gets a, an emoji or a, any character that's beyond that size. Uh, so the solution we did, which uh, is in the classyschema.org website, is you uh, we have a little tool that you can enter an emoji and it comes out with some text. You put that text on the page and then a little bit of code goes and goes and finds all the bits of text and turns them back into emojis. So turning un, unusable Unicode into just normal text. Uh, and yeah, so that, that's free on classyschema.org slash emojis, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've just shared um, the, the link to the rest of the audience. Um, if you haven't played around with that, it's so, so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> because you could like actually get like um, kind of like the visualizer that Screaming Frog has for the like how a website um, kind of looks like um, uh, you like you can look at the same kind of thing with structured data and I just think that that's such a cool visual tool to be able to see like how it kind of like fits in with other um, bits of structured data and how it all nests. Yeah. Yeah, I've so, had some feedback so awesome. on from people kind of going like. Because uh, it's not really a validation tool, but when you visually look at it, you can see that you've kind of got five products, but it should be one, or uh, <laughs> or that your organization, your, your product might reference an organization, but you also yeah. had organizations somewhere else, and they're not yeah. linking together. And as soon as you see it on the graph, it's like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. The four names that's listed because like someone just has item prop name on a you also you may also like and then all of a sudden the product has four names great yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, no, no, I'll, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll ask your your question Peter um uh, oh, it's, it's, ask it. yeah you, you please please ask it okay. <laughs> and then I'll get to mine. <laughs> Um, bearing in mind, I haven't actually physically used BigCommerce, but you mentioned that you can only have one sitemap. So I was yeah. wondering, can you use a sitemap to just be a sitemap index to other sitemaps and point those sitemaps to, say, a subdomain, for example? Yeah, I think that that is a trick you can do in the app. So as long as you own the other domain, I think, yeah. you can yeah, put yeah, your yeah. sitemap on someone else's site. Yeah, so yeah. you can do that. You, you can actually upload... Uh, uh, you can get manually upload your own files, uh, but obviously the the hard thing about that is is how do you create them? Uh, yeah. And I, I think things like uh, you, using, say, Screaming Frog to crawl defeats the yeah. point of a sitemap. Is yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's to tell what ones you do want crawling, not the ones that can be crawled anyhow. Yeah, I agree because that's the that sitemap trick is something I use for you know when we talk about next as well. But like essentially, if you can't add something to the sitemap if you have either the domain validated for example or you actually can verify that um subdomain as well in search console mm. uh you can add urls into a subdomain and it in the sitemap and it works perfectly fine like uh, so yeah it's really really useful in case you're stuck with i can't control the sitemap what can i do mm. yeah that's, that's the top uh, trick i think you might be coming up with a few more in shopify yeah, um, oh, yeah. Uh, the robot text <laughs> one Oh, uh, there's a solution I, to that. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. Which it's kind of a similar kind of trick um, by hosting it potentially on the subdomain, right, Peter? With oh, robots.txt. Well, uh, the solution for robots.txt would have to be an edge solution, so Cloudflare. Mm -hmm. so, oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the only way because I've heard people say that you can redirect it, but that's actually not true. But we'll talk about it when we're talking. We're not talking about Shopify yeah. now. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So I, I like I find that I find that topic endlessly fascinating. Okay. So um, keeping on big commerce, um, you mentioned um, earlier in your talk about um, out of stock products um, and you know massive um, potential for four hundred fours. Um, I kind of just wanted maybe just to share with our audience like what what you consider to be best practice for um, for out of stock products on big commerce. Uh, well, don't make them disappear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so the, the default behavior is uh, the I think you've got a choice of whether it gets taken out of the category uh, and so that's probably well it's a decision for you like uh, uh, you can either have the products still there you want to make sure the out of stock ones don't clog up and people can't see in stock ones uh, so maybe uh, it is that you take you have them disappear from the category pages, but they still exist. So they're still in Google's index, uh, and that's probably there's quite a big subject about how to deal with out of stock uh, in mm. general. Like you put a, a little message. Do you make it very clear on the page? Uh, the structured data uh, will actually indicate that in Google search results that it's currently out of stock. Uh, hopefully, I think uh, the Google Merchant Center and uh, Google Search are starting to enhance the product structure data and the feeds, and that's hopefully going to be faster because you, you have the problem that it's saying out of stock, but that was three weeks ago. Mm. Uh, so it'd be nicer if uh, something like that will uh, speed up the uh, – so Google's in sync all the time. Uh, but yeah, I think yeah. just the default settings is pretty much the okay. And then you can look into the idea of uh, giving an enhanced user experience on dealing with out of stock. Yeah. I think um, like is like out of stock is like so fascinating because I think, you know, this is a really, really common thing with a lot of e-commerce stores. You know, things mm. will go out of stock um, or they'll just basically discontinue product lines and a lot of the time I think they're just like, oh, okay, well, we'll just basically just delete these because that seems um, like the natural thing for, for us to do. But, of course, they don't realize that it creates um, tons of 404s and we'll, we might see them if we've got, like, custom, um, you know, tools set up <laughs> in our GA or, um, you know, in tools like SEMrush and they'll just, like, have, like, increase 404 and then they'll be like, oh, well, these are all the products that we've discontinued. Um, mm. I know that in big commerce, you know, you can have things where like, um, say, like you've got a, a sale on, um, you know, you've got like the price was and then like the new price. Um, is there like something uh, of that equivalent that you can maybe like have um, like temporary out of stock is like that kind of like front facing UX? Yeah, the uh, so the templating system, you, you've got uh, this handlebars command. So you, you can customize uh, quite a lot with kind of doing if stock status equals, then put this HTML in. So you can do that on the server. And also a lot of people do some fancy stuff in JavaScript nowadays to uh, uh, if to move the page around and do weird things. Uh, but there are definite ways to, uh, to do that. Uh, I think another common one is like putting little uh, little flags on the when, when you're in a category page to highlight things like out of stock or other things with little mm. badges on the images and things like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's flexible enough to do that. Yeah, awesome. We'll go to um, a question from the chat. Um, so Kuhan asks, um, thanks Tony for helping me out last year. Oh. Such a legendary dude. <laughs> With the product schema, it worked out really well. Awesome. Um, do, do you foresee schema plugins for big commerce similar to what we see in WordPress and Magento too? Uh, there's uh, we have one competitor. <laughs> <laughs> of course you've got your you've got your app. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's so we we proved it's definitely possible. Uh, the but one of the downsides of big commerce is the app market is a lot smaller. So mm -hmm. you, you're typically looking at one or two options for, for something rather than in WordPress, you might have a hundred. Uh, mm -hmm. On the flip side, the quality uh, standard is a lot higher. So say you've got a, 
a payment uh, app, it's going to be big commerce is going to double check it 10 times before it's going to be allowed to, to go on the system. Whereas anybody can uh, put something on WordPress and, and you kind of got to test it yourself, trust reviewers, things like that. Uh, so hopefully not too much competition in the future for big commerce. <laughs> got a little um, monopoly in the market there. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, too, like if you can, um, if you can maybe like post, I'd love to be able to share that with our audience as well, um, so they can like like grab it and play around with it. Of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got. Um, yeah, I've I've kind of also got my own questions. <laughs> um, I was wanting to know. Um, about like like um, like pa like page builder regions and things like that, um, you know, because I know like big commerce, um, you know, they've got like page builder widget regions um, that are unique to their relative placement on the site. So, you know, like um, category pages, product pages, you know, what have you. Um, but like, there's like it's kind of like always been in the back of my mind. Like, it'd be really awesome to have like a site wide widget. Um, to be able to like you know do that and um, you know they like yeah. the banner the banner functionality isn't isn't like the most UX friendly <laughs> um, or at least no. like not to me at least um, it's, so it's the yeah same position, that's it oh, well top and bottom I think is the banners mm. and page builder is very new it's only on some pages and. Uh, so, yeah, it's new. So there's only a few widgets around. I think it's mainly kind of so you can customize the home page. I think that's that that you can put a bunch of stuff in. Uh, what I'd love is uh, something like WordPress, where you people can invent their own widgets to put into the system. Uh, so instead of like uh, our FAQ editor is a, on a separate website, they have to edit it there copy paste into the page and so it's a bit clunky uh, it'd be nice if if that could be merged in uh, like uh, uh, say uh, Yoast has their FAQ widget uh, you just drag that into the page uh, so it's, it's early days uh, so doing a WYSIWYG style editing of the theme is a bit limited uh, at the moment uh, but they're definitely going in that direction. And if you can't do it, you have to start editing template files. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, for for this, yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's pretty much on the cards just yet. Um, just trying to like keep um, the developer budget pretty lean. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we um, actually we avoid template file edits completely. We mm. uh, there's one limitation of the new theming system is pretty much the theme developer has full con has control of the theme. Yeah. And if they do, if you install an update, all your edits are lost. So you can you can edit yourself, but all you right. can't. So you you've got to kind of catch catch there that a. Uh, uh, if you customize it, you've you've got to manually merge, so you kind of got to separate out from the theme developer. Uh, uh, like WordPress has problems like that as well, because you, if you edit a file, that file then becomes separated out as well. Uh, so at least WordPress lets you kind of do it on a per file basis, but this it just wipes them all out. Yeah. So uh, you, you've got to know how to manage theme editing. And then yes. I guess like you know that major difference. Like if they're wanting to update update to like jQuery three or something like that, which is like a single file, um, like one, it's so much more susceptible to breaking, <laughs> and yeah. and into like you know they decide to update. You know they're always like tell you when. Um, yeah, just gonna pretty much wipe that all out by the sounds of things. Yeah, uh, basically people might use GitHub. Uh, or or something like that so you can or just diff tools so you before you upgrade you see what's been diffed so that mm. you know how to reapply it afterwards uh, mm. and yeah so that, that's uh, theme editing I think is troublesome mm. so we uh, part of the reason we went the app route is because the app and all the scripts are outside of the theme so they don't yeah, get affected awesome. when you update. 
Sorry. Peter, do you have a question? I, I feel like I cut you off a little bit. Question, but it's probably more appropriate if we were like in person, so I can pester with follow ups. Because like, I was gonna ask, like, <laughs> like what the build process like with uh, theming with big commerce? Like, do you have to have like you know? I guess you have Git, you have branches, for example, if you want to do features. And like, cause it sounds to me like it was like you were editing the theme within like within big commerce itself instead of using like a Git process and a push, you know, that kind of stuff. But yeah, yes, yeah, so, um, uh, shop owners just edit it within the. Ed- uh, within the admin interface, so and that's the risk. Uh, but uh, proper theme developers, uh, they've actually got a full-blown uh, uh, Node.js driven thing, and uh, the core theme is in GitHub. So uh, for a proper de- developer, you've got full, you've got a lot of control, uh, and mm. but it, you've got to go a step for it to become a developer. You've got to be a developer. Uh, the average Joe yeah. can't do that. Uh, um, and so, uh, yeah, so people just fiddling with the theme have just got to be careful and do uh, backups. And uh, that's one thing we, we, we constantly do backups. And then we can do a, an easy diff to see, because uh, sometimes a client might say, our code's broken. And we can go in and go, well, that actually wasn't our code that got changed. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't us. <laughs> um, okay, I have maybe like one final question um, before we move on to Shopify SEO. Um, mm. And I, this is really, really super relevant to maybe like um, SEOs out there or site owners um, who are looking to replatform. Um, now, of, of course, like I don't know about you, but like I'm doing like so many site migrations right now. It's coming out of the wazoo, uh, wherever that is. <laughs> um, and I, I get this question a lot, which is, um, you know, what is the best platform for, you know, X, Y, Z um, kind of functionality? And, um, you know, like as, as a bit of a thing, like first question, um, what is the kind of like best, um, the best kind of like um, in a perfect world migration to Shopify from, um, another CMS because they kind of just speak the same kind of language a little bit. Uh, What's like the easiest? <laughs> uh, well, what, one thing I'd, I'd tell people to do first is to work out what your requirements are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so things like Big Commerce and Shopify have a rich core set of features, yeah. but they're a little bit stuck. Uh, yeah. So they're not as flexible as the hundred plugins you can put into WordPress. Mm. So if you can determine that your requirements fit a pretty standard e-commerce store, uh, then something like Shopify and Big Commerce might be your best move. Uh, I, I know in Big Commerce and probably in Shopify is uh, they're very strong on support on on helping you migrate for obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, and there are quite a few uh, uh, third-party companies that support you through that. Uh, and so that's probably your main path once once, once you've done that. Because uh, I know if you don't do it right, if you, if you switch over and you don't know what your old URLs are or something like that, it's kind of too late. So yeah. it's, it's worth doing a bit of uh, due diligence and learn how to migrate uh, before you do a commitment and make sure mm. Big Commerce or Shopify can do every feature you want because you don't want to go all the way along and then go, but I have to use this payment system and it's not there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, if I, talk I'm, to your SEO company as well yeah, yeah. before you migrate. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't actually do that sort of stuff ourselves. We focus on the app. Uh, mm. But I, I've actually got one client who moved from Big Commerce to WordPress because their needs were very unique. Uh, it was more of like a, a small number of products, but very content around the product was needed. And WordPress was far better. And weird payment system. Um, is there any, could they also go headless? Because I was looking up that you can go headless with big commerce. So if they had a very custom solution, would that possibly be a solution for that? That, that, could get, that gives you a broader set, yeah. So they've got a WordPress plugin uh, to make WordPress the front end. Uh, yeah, in fact, actually, yeah, uh, the it integrates also with a 
eBay and Facebook and things like that. So you can automatically power those systems with your big commerce stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what they call it multi something or multi channel. Uh, okay. So yeah. quite a few options to uh, at least uh, vary the front end. The back end is still uh, whatever payment system it supports, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, is there like a really major? Sorry. <laughs> is there like a really major, majorly common um, payment system that big commerce doesn't support? Because I wasn't aware that it couldn't um, support most. No, I, I think it supports all the big ones. But again, like yeah. uh, with, with with my client, uh, they sell to teachers and they wanted to plug in a uh, get an estimate type thing or something like that. So they needed something very custom yeah. uh, to to process by the purchasing process. Uh, and big commerce is based around a uh, single page checkout. Yeah. And uh, it does all the all the standard stuff perfectly nice and quickly. Yeah. But it's very hard to make it do something weird. Yeah. Hmm. So maybe like as um, as like a site grows or you know and along with um, the potential for what they can do like if they were to be able to have like a quote based system or anything like that, then maybe um, e commerce is a little bit inflexible with that growth for yeah, long term. Yeah, and again, if, if you, well, I guess if you don't know that, you didn't know that at the beginning. Uh, mm. So uh, they, uh, continually, both Shopify and big commerce, they're really mature now. So mm. the, the, the templating languages are pretty good, APIs are really good. So uh, it's getting more and more how third parties can actually get in there. And if you do WordPress as the front end, you might be able to get around other problems. But uh, uh, I think you'll always find it's going to be a bit more restrictive than mm. if you've got full access to all the PHP. Yeah. And I would imagine mm. like um, <laughs> having to like lean on um, development to be able to do that. One, you've got to find, you've got to arm yourself with a really, really good de like developer or a team of developers who, um, who at least like um, are willing to put in the time or have done this previously. Because um, I would imagine that that's something that not everybody has done. Um, but also like potentially a costly endeavor. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, because there's not that many people who develop for big commerce or, or nowhere near as many as WordPress. Yeah. So uh, you'll be you you to get a developer on WordPress, which you'll probably need because of all the plugins and they won't <laughs> talk to each other properly. Yeah. Uh, but you can get reasonably priced developers, whereas if if there's only one or two who know a certain aspect of big commerce, you kind of stuck in there. So it, it is definitely. The more custom you're going, there's, that's more of a reason to go to something that is uh, like Magento or WordPress, where you can, you've got loads of developers and a very flexible system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for your time. I know we went over a little bit with the questions, but um, yeah, big commerce is is so fascinating because I think. Um, when we were talking before this started, we were want to, like I wanted to know kind of like what is the scale um, when we're talking about big commerce versus Shopify? Like how many, like how many users actually use <laughs> big commerce? Mm -hmm. I think it was within the realm of um, you know somewhere around fifty thousand active users right now. Um, thanks, Peter, for confirming that. <laughs> um, but I think uh, you know, like Bill Withers also said like you know in the past it's gone up to anywhere around about like one hundred and ten thousand um, users historic who have historically used big commerce. So I think that's um, you know while while you're saying like um, that there there are less and it's a little bit more bespoke potentially with um, the kind of talent out there who can do some really cool custom things. Um, Big commerce. I've got a couple of clients who are on it. Um, it is pretty. It is pretty like powerful and awesome at what it does. Um, particularly if it has some standard out of the box e-commerce site um, functionality. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much, Tony, for your time. That was awesome. Yeah. Just one more. One more thing, guys. Um, please go and follow Tony um, on Twitter. He's always posting some um, absolute gold little nuggets in there um so yeah he's he's a really really good one to follow <laughs> and he's obviously a lovely guy yeah thank you so much yes. all right
<laughs> um, yeah, and also just post your links, post your links so that people can find the apps and um, classes schema and um, the Chrome extension. Because I, I didn't even know you had a Chrome extension, dude. <laughs> Thought we were friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah uh, I'll have to log in. I could be getting... <laughs> That's all right. I'll if you want, um, post them in the private chat, and I'll, I'll um, put okay. it out on yeah, blast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With um, no further ado, I would love. I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to welcome um, Peter Machinkovic, who will be, of course, sharing Shopify SEO, which um, has 1.4 million users worldwide, um, and of course, that um, that usership is only exponentially rising as um, everyone is realising the value of. Um, of the online presence. So um, without further ado, I will now add your presentation to the stream. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Peter. Hey, everyone. Um, just give me a second. I'm going to switch to a window where I can actually control my presentation. OK. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Um, no worries. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter. Um, I work as a technical SEO strategist um, at a company called Innovate Online. So I get to work some tech magic on JB Hi-Fi, T2, Metricon, Harehouse, Cup of course, some really cool clients. Only one of those clients is on Sh Shopify, but a lot of them work on some really interesting um, platforms as well. So I, I'm very busy as a technical SEO. And we also have Commerce Cloud, which isn't a great platform as well. But yeah, not about that. Um, so about me, I've been tinkering away in Shopify uh, since probably about 2015, uh, back in my previous role as a digital marketing manager. And I've been been working in the web for, uh, since about 2011 and I've been a regular at this SEO Melbourne meetup for over six years. December 2014, I stalked my old meetup um, things. That was the very first meetup I ever went to. So yeah, so six plus years I've been to the SEO meetup. Yay. Great. So what this talk covers, this is basically the same talk I gave on July 2019. Very little changes here and there, but Nick wasn't there, so this is her first time actually seeing it, so that'll be good. So we're basically going to talk about what exactly Shopify is, um, how Shopify content types and how the CMS works in a, in a general uh, general sense, and also the limitations of Shopify and why it's very hard to do SEO in Shopify and little quirks here and there, and actual practical solutions so that you can actually get the most out of Shopify from an SEO standpoint. Great, so let's get started. So what is Shopify? So Shopify was first developed in 2004 by Toby Lutke, uh, I guess, and all his roommates, all his coworkers or whatever, because they wanted to find a solution to sell snowboards online. And all the e-commerce platforms they felt at the time just sucked. Um, and eventually, they released in 2006, they built in Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails is a, pro a monolithic programming platform, really fun to build in. But in the last seven or so years, it's really exploded in popularity. So probably since about 2013 or so, it's really gotten there. And it's a it's a hosted CMS. It has a rich marketplace for apps and integrations, and is just really really easy to get started with. So, do you want to build an e-commerce store? Uh, this is from Frozen. Um, it's a very bad meme, but yeah. So essentially, the main appeal I guess for Shopify is that it is it is really really popular because it's very very easy to get started in. So you know, Shopify has exploded in popularity. I mentioned the last seven years. Um, it is, we mentioned it has 1.4 million installations worldwide. And this is the search volume when you compare some of the other major competitors uh, in the last five years. Hey, there's Gaston giving his hands up there. So you can see Shopify in blue, you have Magento, which was a dominant e-commerce uh, platform for the, last, for the last decade or even 15 years or so. You have WooCommerce, which is the WordPress implementation. Of course, BigCommerce, which is what Tony talked about earlier as well. And you can see that for the last five years, how Shopify has risen and then kind of just keep, kept on going. So it's very, very popular. And one of the reasons why it's popular is because uh, it is a hosted platform. So you don't have to configure hosted files, FTP files. You don't have to know how to code to get started to sell Shopify. Anyone can get started in show, Shopify, upload their products, input some data fields, and bang, you're up and running. Website, secure, everything, boom. So let's actually talk about Shopify CMS and the content, type, the content types that actually belong in Shopify. So these are all Shopify's components, all in its glory. So you have basic components. The way Shopify works is that they kind of keep you in a kitty box. They you, can, you can't create your own custom content types. You're kind of stuck with only producing what they allow you to produce. So you have a very basic page. So you can only create a page. All the URLs will be the same, be slash pages slash the page URL. 
you have products. All the products are the same as well. There's every single product URL is slash products slash product URL. There are some variations I'll talk about later with how they handle vendors and parent categories, that sort of thing. But essentially, it's all a very structured way. So all products have the same kind of product URL structure. Collections, organize products into filterable categories. So you can have a list of products. There's other features there with tagging and that kind of thing that we'll talk about later. You have blogs, which is actually a very bad name for a blog category because technically a blog is a blog category it's slash blog slash blog is something that you'll see a lot in a Shopify store I skipped over articles but articles belong to a blog so you have an article that belongs um, to a to an actual blog category but it's actually called a blog it's awful naming scheme it's basically hasn't changed in 2015 it's been awful uh, you have menus which used to be called link lists so these help categorize urls and when i first got started with shopify these were very limited and we had to do some awful hacky things today they're a little bit better because you can do some nesting which can help you with things such as um, very sophisticated menus information architecture and breadcrumbs and so forth and you also have meta fields which is kind of like your hidden little gem of flexibility in shopify these are little hidden fields that you can add to any of these above content types uh, with the exception of menus, I believe, that you can basically store any kind of value there. There's also some special reserve meta fields, such as the page title, the meta description that are actually stored in every single item that's hidden. And you can edit these, but Shopify actually gives you mechanisms to edit that. So let's get started with the first one, which is collections. Uh, last time I talked products first. So collections are basically, this is how the CMS looks in Shopify. And you can add basically a title, a uh, piece of rich content, there's also some elements of categorization and the list of products, which I don't bother to include here, and some tags as well. So you can edit that um, there. You can add this this with actual collections. This is the only place where you can actually edit the product, uh, the collection page title and the meta description uh, with stuff such as tagging, where I'll talk about how the URL structures work. Um, you can't actually modify their page title and meta description for those natively with Shopify. It's quite a bit of customization to do so, which I can talk about later. And multiple tags are blocked by the robots or text, which I'll talk about later. So this is an example of JB Hi-Fi's uh, collection on JB Hi-Fi. This is the mobile phones category. If you Google mobile phones, hopefully we're number one in Google, maybe we're number two. So essentially, this is the URL, that structure that you can see. It would be jbhifi.com.au slash collection slash mobile phones. So we actually did a customization with JB Hi-Fi. It's not typical with most Shopify stores. Uh, they kind of copied what I did in my last job, except they did it a little bit smarter. And because we have actual really talented developers at JB Hi-Fi, you can do that kind of stuff. But that's essentially the kind of structure. You're basically stuck with the slash collection slash collection name. There's also other types of variations of the collection URL, such as filters. So you have a sort by, for example, those kind of things. But they would actually canonicalize to the normal collection URL. Yay, thanks for confirming there, Nick. <laughs> it, it changes every hour. So if you Google every single hour, you'll probably see one or two. It's, it's like, um, there's also other types. This is my former um, employer, Kiana Beauty. So another example is of URL structure for collections would be the uh, pagination. So you have page equals two, page equals three. That's the native implementation. And the canonical URL in Shopify actually changes to match that. So the canonical URL would say canonical is page equals two, which is actually the proper way to handle it, though it's very debatable in the SEO community how to handle pagination, canonicalization, that sort of thing. But there is one thing you have to watch out for, which is the page equals one. Um, if you can, try to avoid page equals one ever rendering with your back buttons or your rendered ones, make that the actual root URL because that will actually canonicalize, I believe, to the root URL, which can cause problems because duplicates, which is different canonical URLs. And you can confirm as well. Thank you. Uh, now I need to his comment this a bit so I can read the other one. Okay, so the example on the right is an example of a tag. So the way Shopify handles tagging, with collection pages is you have the collection and your collection handle. So in this example, we have a brand Chanel and we have slash makeup, for example, as a URL structure. So this is one of the ways it helps with filtering down products. But the problem with this natively in Shopify is that you can't overwrite things such as a page title, the main product heading, any sort of thing that to actually indicate that this is a unique page with different products than what you see above. So to say that the Chanel makeup page is different to the Chanel page, you, ha you have to do quite a bit of customization to do that, which I have, but that was a lot of hard work. Um, but the thing you have to watch out for is with multiple tags. So something like the way Shopify handles multiple versions 
terms of tags is to add a plus between the tags. So it'd be slash Chanel slash makeup plus oily skin. Those URLs are actually blocked by Shopify. And unless you actually ro uh, overwrite the robust the text, you can't actually change this. So you have to either be very, very careful of how you link with it, or you can just have a whole bunch of anchor text that are uncrawlable anyway with Google. It depends on how you want to handle it. But just be conscious that if you try to optimize a page that's not indexable, you're basically wasting resources. All right, so that's a high level stuff for collection. I've got more interesting stuff to talk about that later on. But now I'm going to talk about products. So products are all, as I mentioned earlier, with a very structured URL structure. You have slash product slash product handle. That is the native structure of all products in Shopify. When you look at the sitemap and you look at the product sitemap, all products will have this URL structure. But one thing you have to look out for in Shopify is that product URLs also render with the collection ahead of the products. So the slash collection slash collection name slash products slash products name so for example if i had slash collection slash makeup slash products slash um spf foundation for whatever brand that is also a url that by default for a lot of shopify themes that will canonicalize to the above URL, which is the clean one, the slash product slash product handle. The problem is that with a lot of Shopify themes, this is actually the default uh, URL they have with their collection for because it helps them with um, stuff like uh, breadcrumbs, for example, because it's a very clear parent URL. Uh, this is a problem because uh, essentially the native URL, the slash product slash product handle isn't actually found natively within the category pages with a lot of Shopify themes. I would say probably about 50% of them, maybe 70% of them because they want to include breadcrumbs in some way. And so I recommend you actually clean up your code. It's usually in collections.for loop or whatever in their code and just remove that within collection uh, liquid. Um, but yeah, that's actually a big problem because essentially those slash products slash product handles are essentially orphan pages that are only discoverable via canonical canonicalization and the sitemap URL. So clean that up. And you also have variants, which are represented by query string. These are um, ways to actually handle multiple variations of a product. So you might have a different color, different sizes. Uh, the interesting thing about Shopify is that if your product has more than two variants, you will automatically redirect the product URL to the first variant, but it will canonicalize to it. So essentially you're canonicalizing to something that will always free one redirect. Um, it's an interesting way to handle it. It does fine from an SEO standpoint, but it's probably not ideal. Ideally, you probably have the original URL not redirect and they just render the, the first variant in some way, but that's just the way that they handle it. Um, so in nature, this is what it kind of looks like a product URL. So you can see here, I've got a variant color and that's essentially what it looks like. It'd just be a variant and you have multiple colors. This particular uh, nail polish has, I believe, maybe somewhere between 20 to 40 different shades, if I'm thinking of the right one, but it will canonicalize to the actual correct Lavernus Longwell nail color shade. Hopefully that still ranks for Chanel nail polish, but I haven't touched that account in a year. But um, so we'll see how that goes. But that's essentially some of the problems that you have to be aware of when you're optimizing for products is the URLs and just making sure that they're all clean and discoverable. Uh, blogs, I don't want to really talk that much about blogs because there's so many more interesting things to talk about. But blogs are basically blog categories. Um, they just have the structure of slash blog slash blog name. It's pretty awful, honestly. Um, it provides a feed burner URL, so I guess you can use it for RSS feeds. And it's a very, very Ruby on Rails gem install feel for it. It basically feels like a gem that you install if you were doing if you're building a Rails app, for example. It's not really, it's not like something that Shopify put love in to develop this blogging feature. Uh, one common thing I've seen is that people do multiple blogs to create different blog categories, but it can actually make a very big mess from a crawlability standpoint. So they'll create blogs that have different articles, but then they'll have different tags. And then you all of a sudden have so many different articles and all these redundant pages where they should have just had one blogging section or one news section or whatever they wanted to call it. So I recommend, unless for very special circumstances where you want to have to work around something, uh, only have one blog. And that one blog should house all your articles. So essentially you have um, tags in the articles. Um, I actually try to avoid tags, honestly. I don't think they're very, very useful for um, articles, but that's something to give a debate. And unlike products, there's no mechanism to um, narrow by multiple tags. Uh, essentially the way the, the URL structure works is the blog slash tag slash the tag name in the handle. And there's also quite a few bugs with it as well. I've, I've 
filed a few bugs over the years where putting an apostrophe in a tag, for example, breaks all the tags in that particular tag. Um, back in 2016, these used to be awful because all the URLs used to be automatically generated with some stupid little slug and you couldn't actually reference the handle and code. So pulling articles into other parts of the website was actually impossible. But fortunately, that's been fixed. So if you want to use articles, um, blogging content, this is where you can do it. And I keep it within, I strongly recommend to keep it within one blog just to avoid having a crawling nightmare. Uh, menus, menus is a really, really important mechanism in um, Shopify, not just as a menu, but as a way for you to organize your links. You can use it as a reference material in your theming to essentially categorize things. And this is the primary reason what I use link menus for, not just for main menus or sub menus, that kind of thing, is actually to design the information architecture for the website. So if you remember before I said that I recommend using the, um, the clean version of a product URL, well, the issue with the clean version of product URL is actually you have no idea of context for where that product exists within Shopify. Like it's just the product on its own. You don't know how many categories deep you're in, that kind of thing with other CMSs. So you can actually order a menu, create a nested menu and actually structure it so you can have like some kind of category categorization. So you have computers and a child of that could be laptops and laptops could be like Acer laptops and Acer laptops could be like Acer whatever the brand name is. And you can go really, really deep and have that to actually fit as your categorization. So you can, that way you can really easily build breadcrumbs on individual products is based on how they're structured. Menus have handles and they can be actually referenced in code. They can be looped, iterated on, and are very, very flexible from a coding standpoint. And last, you have meta fields. Meta fields are the little hidden fields that you have. This is using Shopify FD. This is from last year's presentation, which doesn't work anymore, but I have a solution for you to edit meta fields later on. But the invisible fields that help they're attached to an object, any of the objects, such as a page, a product, a collection, um, an article, and so forth. So if you don't, within Shopify's normal fields to edit objects, such as page title, body, that kind of thing, if you're limited by that and you want to add something that's like on the side or you want to add something, some special meta description, or if you have some kind of parameter that needs to be included in schema, for example, uh, this is really, really useful because it just stores that value invisibly that can be referenced in code. Um, so they contain things such as a namespace, a key, and a value. And there's also some very, very default ones within Shopify. So all the page titles and meta descriptions in Shopify are actually meta fields. Um, it's just very easy to interface with them within the native Shopify CMS. But these are things that you, if you had a meta field editor, you can actually just directly edit the meta fields if you actually knew what they were called. And here is an example of me adding some schema, for example, and here uh, me changing the canonical URL. I had a whole bunch of customizations with meta fields, which were really, really cool. And also some schema stuff you can see with significant link. So limitations and quirks of Shopify. So first, before I even talk about it, let's just talk about Shopify as a concept. Uh, like Tony mentioned, similar to BigCommerce, Shopify is a hosted CMS. So what a hosted CMS means is that you don't have access to it from a server side level. You can't go in there and FTP in and make changes. You can't physically add certain files. You can add assets to the theme, that sort of thing, but you can't, it's not your code to own. You don't have the Rails app running on a server. You can't write Ruby on it. You have to work within what Shopify is. So because Shopify is hosted for you, which is a plus because you don't have to have developer overhead. You don't have to pay maintenance costs for a developer, that sort of thing. It's a limitation because anytime you need any form of customization outside of Shopify, you are hitting a wall. So the first limitation outside of the box for Shopify from an SEO standpoint is, of course, the robust text file. Uh, it's probably one of the most well-known issues with Shopify is that you cannot modify the robust text file out of the box. It is locked in by whatever the powers that be in Shopify that are deemed to include and be Here's the magical ones. And as an SEO, you can look at it and you can say, oh, that's a weird decision. Why did they do that? Okay, that's there's even stuff that actually blocks the native functionality, which I've pointed out in a Quora post. But yeah, so essentially things like multi-word vendors are blocked by default in Shopify. I mentioned before the property that anything that has a plus with tagging is like with multiple tags. The similar is true. They did something similar with vendors, which is what they call brands. So if I had a brand called Calvin Klein and natively in Shopify, the query parameters like query vendor equals Calvin plus Klein, Essentially, that whole page is actually blocked in Google. So you have to, and also you have, 
there's anything with encoded spaces are blocked. It's really, really annoying, honestly. Um, I've, as you can tell, I've pulled my hair out several times over it. And also, because it's a hosted um, file, sometimes it can go down. I've had three different instances in five years, which isn't too bad, where the robots.txt file got overwritten and went haywire. So set up some kind of monitoring tool where you can actually contact Shopify support. And then when you get in touch with Shopify support, ask for the good support to tell them to identify the issue. So I've essentially, I've had to disallow all files happen to Shopify multiple times. Um, fortunately, we're in 2020, uh, specifically August, and it can be modified with Edge SEO, which I can briefly go over in the end. But that essentially means that there is a solution for this that wasn't possible until literally about March of this year. And here's an example of brands being blocked in uh, Google. So this is essentially the uh, default functionality for how brands are handled in Shopify. And you can see anything that has more than one word, so dress up, um, paleo chocolate, all blocked by robots or text, all in Google. You can probably look that up in Google, do, do a specific uh, search operator and look at all that glory of their brands being blocked in Google. Awesome Shopify, awesome. Uh, the next one is sitemap. So the sitemap is locked in, but kind of. So every single object that you create, a page, a product, a collection, and articles as well, so blog articles specifically, uh, created into your sitemap.xml file. So the sitemap has about 5,000 URLs each. So if you have 50,000 products like JB Hi-Fi, you have about 10 product sitemaps in a sitemap index. And essentially, we'll just split it up into those particular sitemaps. And it's kind of automatically generated, but you can exclude stuff in the sitemap. So it includes everything. But say, for example, you have a category page that you don't want to be in Google. It's a hidden category, but it's only used as a reference point for other categories. It might be storing a page title and meta description, for example, or it might be storing um, other materials, like a collection of collections, that kind of thing, the pseudo collection. Well, with meta fields that we mentioned earlier, there's a special uh, meta field in Shopify where you can actually exclude uh, pages, uh, articles, anything you want, collections, products from the sitemap. So that's the namespace is SEO, it's hidden, and you set the value to one, which is really confusing because one usually means true, but you're saying, is what that does is that for that particular URL or for that particular piece of content, that will no longer be automatically added to the sitemap. And this is where you can kind of use to remove some default stuff. So for example, I think most, if not all Shopify stores has a page or a collection called front page, and you probably should remove that by default. It's like, if you look at sitemaps, you can see like this, like automatically generated ones from Shopify. And there's also like sometimes, for example, collections all, which if you have collections all, but you're very narrow in scope of what you do, you might sell nappies, for example. You don't want to have collections slash all as your main category. You might want to have collections slash nappies. So you might want to get rid of all from Google, uh, no index it, hide it from Google, just make sure it never sees a light of day, and then essentially use another category outside of the defaults. So this is the only way you can control sitemaps in regards to omitting stuff from the sitemap. Um, there's also one more trick. Oh, that's, a, that's an example of doing bulk edits. So this is using the bulk editor from Metafield, so to remove particular pages from the sitemap. Uh, I was hoping to have a slide, but I think it might be elsewhere, but essentially there is a way to do to add another sitemap, which I talked about in the big commerce one as well, which is where you actually link to a subdomain. So you actually can do a redirect to a subdomain and then that subdomain contains a sitemap and Google will actually respect that. And it's actually really, really great. So that's the only other way you can add other URLs, but I think that's in another section of this presentation. Canonical URLs. Okay, I'm just gonna have a quick drink. So canonical URLs as handled by Shopify is a little bit strange. So Shopify essentially generates the canonical URLs for you. And they're usually based on what the actual um, product pages are. So I think I said that edge. Um, so their canonical URLs uh, are based on certain defaults. So like the collection URL, they have some very particular ones in regards to like collection, the way the collections have behavior with the like, tags and that kind of stuff. So they will do the, They'll, they'll, I think they're canonicalized tags by default. Actually, it's been a long time since I've looked at a default of the tags. But essentially, don't use what um, Shopify gives you out of the box. You need to modify what Shopify gives you 
it gives you. So for Kanoku URLs with strange patterns, I'll give you an example. On collection pages, if you have a query string, which is um, a question mark and a Q equals your query parameter, um, by default, Shopify will actually canonicalize that. They'll say that that's a unique version of URL, even if it functionally doesn't do anything, which it doesn't. Um, Our box, it actually doesn't functionally do anything. That's uh, now the reason why that exists in Shopify's um, system is because that's how the vendor's logic worked. And so it essentially was written for one particular collection where that logic existed, but for any other collection that would work. So every single Shopify store that has El Goldia in it, that has a, a client-side rendered query string like this, is in danger of having every variation of that query string being canonicalized and being unique pages seen as Google. So that's a thing that you have to clean up ASAP if that's a problem for you. And um, there's also some strange URL patterns where pages are malformed. For example, I mentioned pages. So you have pages slash your page URL. So you find any page in Shopify, go to any store that hasn't fixed this problem and you put another slash and just type in whatever you want. Just type in, hi, my name is Peter. And then bang that page will render exactly the same. It's not a 404, it's just another URL. The problem is that it actually has its canonical URL as its new URL. You can, if you were nefarious, you could build a whole bunch of links to a whole bunch of non-existent duplicate pages with their own canonical URLs for a website and it, it needs to be overridden. So there's a lot of strange behaviors that the canonical URL does that you need to look and overwrite. So always be testing. The main culprits are typically the category pages with that query string, and that particular page example are the ones that we absolutely look for. Uh, I can't remember if there's another one that's like a big one I always check for, which is like a weird edge case, but those are big ones that I have to do where the canonical URL isn't a real canonical URL, it's a broken mechanic. So overwrite your canonical URLs. So free one redirects. So unlike big commerce, Shopify is very limited with their free one redirects. You can only do one-to-one -one redirects. And you can only do one-to-one -one redirects on a page that has a response of 404. If you do it a free one redirect to a valid page, it will not respect the redirect. It will just render the valid page. So if you had a collection, you said, I want to redirect that collection to something else. You have to unpublish that collection before it does anything. So you can do stuff in bulk, such as Shopify FD, or you can import or export. There's actually a really good mechanism like that. Uh, redirects can be edited and deleted after the fact, which is really, really useful. Um, you can't redirect redirects using a relative URL. Uh, Shopify won't allow you. It will have a bit of a hissy fit. So if you had a redirect, but then one of those redirects historically has changed, and then you try to upload and change that, uh, it will cause a problem because it doesn't want to do chain redirects, which is a good thing, but that just means more work for you to do. So, yeah, so you might have to uh, – there's a limit as well. I didn't write this down, but there's actually a limit for – most Shopify stores of 100,000 um, URLs that you can redirect. Um, in order to exceed 100,000 redirects, you pretty much have to negotiate with Shopify. You probably have to be a Shopify Plus customer and it has to be made an exception. So 100,000 URLs, I believe, is the hard limit of Shopify stores of the amount of URLs you can redirect. And also if you've republished a 404, it may remove the redirect. There's, there's a lot of issues. And there's also impossible redirects. So uh, I think an issue I'll mention later on the slides, there's a lot of slides here, but I'm going to breeze through it because we're 27 minutes in, is that there's some URLs that are broken but don't provide a 404 response. They provide a 200 response. So you can never redirect them. It's impossible. So in order to redirect them, you have to be implemented on the edge, which is using Cloudflare, which I'll talk about hopefully in the end. Oh, I'm talking about it now, HTTP responses. So all published pages respond with a 200 response every single one. So all legal URLs in a collection respond to 201. So that includes a tag. So if I did a collection slash collection ta tag, uh, collection name slash blah, 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 that will be a 200 page always. Now, this is a bad thing because it means you can't redirect it. So if someone messed up, they did this typo, it's a space, it's always kind of beta. So you can't actually redirect it and clean it up. Maybe you can no index it, but it's not worth it, honestly, if you're gonna read no index one weird tag or whatever. But you can use this to your advantage. Something I did in my previous role is that you can actually use that URL structure to represent a actual page. So for example, I created a vanity page for every single category in our previous job for Afterpay. So when you Google stuff like Chanel Afterpay, et cetera, uh, hopefully we're still number one for Chanel Afterpay, but that's essentially what I did. I essentially created landing pages for that. Um, 
And this is the same thing we did for JP Hi-Fi. We like every single category, we only have like 16 or so top level categories and everything else is technically a tag on Shopify, but they're really referencing, they're really just using this technique that a tag is never broken to actually just replace the content with something else. So in, for example, our laptops page in JB Hi-Fi slash computers slash laptops. But in reality, the real laptops collection is like laptops underscored some kind of hash that the JB team created. And then that computer slash laptops page just checks this hidden little collection and then they basically replace that content with the with that invisible tag with that. So I mean, JB Hyper doesn't use any of um, Shopify's native logic anyway, but that's just one example of where you can use the way Shopify handles HTTP responses to your advantage. But it's also your disadvantages. It's quite it's quite a painful thing when a website doesn't behave as it should. So here's an example of vanity pages. So on the left was the Afterpay page. And on the right was like a list of articles, which I never actually published live, like in regards to native IA, but it shows what's possible. You can actually just render the whole article and stuff in the category pages. So conceivably, you could use this to create, for example, buying guides. So you could have slash Chanel slash best Chanel makeup or something like that if I were to have done that, which I didn't, but I, it was possible. And something that we're, we're working on a new... Well, I don't know if I can say it, but we're working on some stuff for JB Hi-Fi that could possibly be utilizing this kind of stuff. So, yeah, so essentially we can replace content with that URL structure in Shopify. Okay. Ah. So let's talk about liquid templating. So liquid is the language that Shopify uh, uses for theming. So it's a very, very simple uh, language. It involves quite a lot of basic logic, so a lot of if statements, unless statements, and some really, really clever things like string manipulations. So like you have the capture feature, we can capture strings and then you can use it to do stuff like handle matching. Um, it's kind of limited because it's not real code. It's not, a, it's not like, it's not Ruby. It's a theming language. So you can't do more than 50 items in a loop unless you do pagination, which is very, very difficult to explain. But it's a very friendly language. If you're not a programmer. It's and it, this was your first language to learn. It's actually a really, really easy language to learn, honestly. And um, its syntax is kind of similar to a lot of other ones like Handlebars or Twig and some other ones, whatever the one that was built for Django all those years ago. But um, if you want to customize Shopify, this is where you're going to do. So when you overwrite your canonical URLs, when you're working with meta fields, uh, this is where you want to do it natively within the theming. All right. So how to get the most from Shopify from search. So first of all, let's talk about meta fields. So uh, previously I recommended a extension called Shopify FD, but unfortunately that extension hasn't been updated in a while and doesn't work anymore. So I recommend this free uh, meta field app called meta fields guru. So it can be, you can use it at the very least to manage your sitemaps, but you can also use it to um, add meta fields uh, to any product or page or whatever you need it for. So in that screenshot, hopefully you can see it. I think I've got the SEO and what, what's that one? Is that canonical or no index? So I'm using like a no index. So if I want to add a no index for a Shopify store, I actually have some logic to do it. So I'll add a meta field to that page. And then if it meets that meta field, then we'll render a no index on that page. So another example of a tip is to split the content. So Shopify, you can't build content models like modern CMSs like Contento, Prismic, um, Data CMS, all these really cool CMSs that no one talks about, but we should because they're the exciting kids on the block. But essentially, I like to use this split feature in Shopify and a lot of developers as well to actually get you some more features out of it. So you can see, hopefully, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I've got like five asterisks or five stars in the actual WYSIWYG. So that WYSIWYG here, the top part of the WYSIWYG is the content and the other one is actually more fuller content. So essentially in code, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the, um, the product description or the category description and I'm looking for every instance where there's five stars in a row. And you can do whatever you want, but I like five stars in a row because it's very easy to communicate with a client. But essentially the anything in the first block before the first five stars is a block that I will put on this part of the page. And anything after the second one, I'll put it elsewhere. So what we like to call text box A and text box B. So for example, at the very top of the page, we have this little text box A content, like nice little SEO content. And then at the bottom, it's going to be massive if I showed you, but like at the bottom of all the products, then, then we're using that 
and adding it to the bottom of the page. So that's a really, really useful use case of splitting that content. You can split it as many ways you want. Like for example, if you have a sidebar that you want to edit, you can make that the third slot and so forth. Um, I can't remember if I have code in my GitHub on how to do this, but I'll maybe I could publish it because I did it for very recently for a client. So I'll be happy to share that and give people maybe a tutorial on how to do that. But it's actually really basic stuff and it's used by a lot of people. But essentially the problem is, is that Shopify doesn't give you many fields to work with. Well, if you want WYSIWYG content and you know it belongs to that product page, but you need it elsewhere, like you need it on the main part of the page, or maybe you want it in like a table or it's like some kind of fancy design. This is a technique where you can actually modify code and have that pieces of content that's easy for a client to work with. You just have to provide them instructions and make sure they follow the instructions. And then that way you can actually also tweak it as well as a, as a developer, as an SEO. Um, there's also bulk editing. So it's really tricky to find this natively within the admin URL, um, but the admin slash bulk, you can do parameters such as resource name equals product and a thousand products. Actually, I think it only shows 250, but that's a different thing. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, and this allows you to do bulk edits of things such as page titles, meta descriptions, and so forth. So if you had to do, say, a hundred product titles and meta descriptions and you know all the products, um, Understanding how to access these URLs is actually really, really helpful. You can also use the cert, the actual native functionality in Shopify, the admin, to select the items based on the filter and edit them. And if those fields are exposed, there's little um, dots there where you can say, I want to edit the page title or the page description or the URL, etc. You can actually kind of build this yourself. The problem is, is that you might not get exactly what you need unless you know how to how these parameters work properly. But it's, it's, if you do find one that works for a lot of recurring work, such as, you know, a common example is bulk editing page titles and meta descriptions. We might write some in bulk. We might get the client to look over them and say, yeah, this is fine. It represents that branding. Great. Well, we'll send someone off to just bulk update them. And that's a resource that it just makes everyone's job easier. And, and also the app ecosystem. So one of the things about Shopify being very popular is that there's actually quite a lot of apps that can help you uh, tweak stuff on it. So I uh, probably one that will help you would be like JSON LD for SEO. That's done by Eric Davis. Uh, I've been following Eric for about 10 years. He uh, as a developer first, so he somehow got into SEO as well. But um, essentially he built an app that really makes it really easy to add rich snippet stuff on Google. You pay for it once and it's just really, really easy. I personally don't use it because I like doing stuff myself, but most people don't have me or like someone with that kind of capability in the organization. So feel free to use an app if there's nothing wrong with using an app. Alternatively, you can also use meta fields to render stuff on the field and use one of those like many services such as Classy Schema, or you can use stuff like Sideshow George's FAQ generator or those and just paste the JSON in there or even just do it in the body of the text. There's many ways to get jobs done. Um, there's also other stuff to help control with bulk redirects and finding 404s. But, um, you know, I, I prefer doing that with Search Console and that kind of stuff. So, like, basically anything I recommend, I don't do myself, but that's only because I, I have my own preferences. The important things as a decision maker for you as a Shopify store owner is say what works for you, what makes your job easier. Oh, and I forgot to recommend also an app called... Um, Power Tools, um, well, I forgot the app, that's probably why I didn't include it, but it's basically Power Tools uh, for bulk tagging and also the filter menu. Um, it did a lot of stuff that I did for Keanu Beauty really easy within an app. So you can actually do stuff like nested collections and those, those sorts of things <clears throat> and information hierarchy. So that was another app I wanted to recommend. Um, if you want to customize your liquid, there's a cheat sheet essentially that you can refer to. Um, and you can also refer to the URL. Um, you have, the thing is you have to learn how to code and even coding like that kind of thing, it's like, it took me years to get like really good at this. And even at that level, like, you know, it's hard to find a use case, but like if you need to do stuff like, such as modifying the canonical URL, that kind of thing, I'm sure I've had some stuff that's been written in my GitHub. I'll probably post it, maybe share it with Sideshow's um, newsletter thing. Um, but yeah, like essentially, if you want to learn how to use Liquid, there's a reference where you can actually look at the cheat sheet and you'll, as long as you know the basics of the syntax, you should be fine, honestly. Uh, Shopify is actually really easy to learn that once you learn the basics and you have a cheat sheet handy, you can probably customize it how you want. It's only when you try to do a weird customization that you'll run into some headbanging. And that's an example of me overriding the page title of my previous job. 
So try to have a look at that, figure out what I'm doing. Pretty cool. Cascading that's an example. Code, baby. Yeah. <laughs> so this is an example of subcategory pages. Uh, from, I was going to use replace this slide with the laptops page, but I have to explain more of the laptops page. This is more basic. Uh, so in my previous role, essentially the tagging system in Shopify, that's not an object. So like a Chanel in the back end is an object, but there's no Chanel number five, or technically there is, but there's, there's no Chanel number five object with that URL pattern of Chanel slash number five, right? So essentially what happens is that I have a hidden category that essentially called Chanel number five doesn't exist in Google's eyes, but that's Chanel slash number five looks at it, say, okay, that's probably this collection. I'll grab the page title, the meta description, the content, et cetera, from that and put it there. And I think we're still page one for that. Very small website as well. If they had links, they'll crush it. But, you know, that's a story for another day. But, like, yeah, essentially, like, you can help customize these kind of pages with references to hidden collections and that kind of level of customization in code. JB Hi-Fi has something similar. Um, they have hidden collections as well in their page title and uh, descriptions and so forth, grab those hidden collections as well, the same way I did in Kiana, only a little bit smarter, because instead of me doing it manually, they have a whole system to do it. So very, very um, clever. And here's another example I did it, which um, was contextual content. So essentially, it was a piece of common content that what we like to call that shows for particular category of pages. So there's quite a lot of um, handle matching there. And essentially that little block on the bottom where you see like that thing there, where it was, we see Glenda and article and the list of articles only shows for all variations of Estee Lauder products or Estee Lauder categories as well, which was kind of a clever one, but the problem is no one knows how it works because I don't work there anymore. So no one can edit it. So that's a, that's a problem. I, I explained it to my replacement how it kind of worked, but like I don't have access. So it was like kind of explaining, like it's kind of this thing where there's like a field somewhere with a hidden thing and you can edit it, but you have to be exactly correct with the handles. So that's a cool example of how you do it. And I have some other ideas of what to do in the future, but it was kind of doing kind of relevant content for all those pages and managing that. Um, so here was an example of using a meta field and then doing that by creating a no index. So this is how I typically do a no index. So first of all, I check if there's an already existing no index, always do that first, because you might accidentally have multiple logics for no index, and you might have multiple no indexes, that's a mistake. So handle all your no index there. And first of all, I check if the template name has a no index. That's a very simple one. I just say if the template says collection dot no index, apply no index, boom. So that means anyone, even an admin who doesn't know what they're doing, can manage themselves to no index a page. Secondly, what I should also do is actually create a path. Uh, I do, do some certain rules. So I have a statement here that says, okay, if it's a search page, no index it. If it has that, then it does that. But also if it has like, uh, well, I just did a default once here, but I also have a meta field that checks that if it has to check the meta field no index, then you also add the no index on the page so we can manually do it. <coughs> so it's really important because um, you can't really apply a no index natively within um, Shopify. So you need to create the logic for it yourself as well. Uh, the problem here is that the canonical URL must exist in Shopify. It's another weird oddity of Shopify. You can't remove a canonical URL from the page. So you have to have a canonical URL on it. You take this developers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, so, um, and yeah, so essentially you can't delete the canonical URL and Google doesn't like no index and canonical being on the same page, but since no index is the directive, it gets the respect first. So like, it's not that big of a deal. Google will just say, oh, why are you doing that? It's not our fault, it's Shopify's fault. Uh, let's make that clear. Cool. All right, um, and another thing to do solutions is Cloudflare. I was hoping to get a sick example of a live client doing this, but you know, there's a lot of security things we had to jump through first. So it wasn't able to get done in time with this presentation. So first of all, um, as of March of this year, I wanted to do a screenshot of a tweet, but I didn't have time. But um, So Nick Ranger, who is over here, asked a question on Twitter, said, hey, can you edit the robots.txt on Shopify or whatever? I said, no, it's impossible. You can't do Cloudflare because of the great crowd cloud problem, essentially the gray cloud problem was, or the orange cloud problem was, Shopify is hosted on Cloudflare, they're, they're Cloudflare's client. And because of that, you couldn't use Cloudflare workers, which is Edge SEO, 
to work because you can't have a Cloudflare hosted website use the service Cloudflare on top of it. It was a weird little stacking thing, just didn't work in the system. But then Cloudflare's CEO said, that's not true. And then like the account manager said, yeah, oh, like talk to my account manager or product manager and said, okay, talk to him. So then I had a couple of long conversations with the people of Cloudflare, were very lovely people. And they said, yeah, no, it's totally true. It's a bit of a weird hacky way how we have to get on top of Shopify and all that kind of thing, but it's totally possible. So you can, and I can confirm this as a fact, overwrite the things like the robots are text or redirect things that's broken, um, that's impossible URLs to redirect and so forth within Cloudflare. So how Cloudflare works for people who don't understand is that it sits between the user, or hopefully you can see me, the user and the website. So you go, to, you access Cloudflare first in between you access cloud, um, the website. And in that in between time, Cloudflare can do implement things called workers to implement stuff. So it essentially has a list of tasks like, okay, if a user is accessing this URL, I'll change this page title. I'll change this. I'll re rewrite this content. I'll upload this. I'll make these changes. Then you can visit the website. So that's, a, that's in essence how the actual workers work. And this is really, really good for a hosted platform like Shopify where you don't have dev access is that you can actually sit on top of the hosted platform, whatever platform it is, as long as you can uh, implement Cloudflare services and just rewrite stuff. So you can rewrite the Shopify, uh, you can rewrite the response code from the server. You can rewrite the content on the page. You can make changes to the CSS, the color, anything you want. I don't recommend you do this as your primary development thing, unless you're doing a static website, which is a different story, but like where the whole websites are basically workers, but like in a website where you don't have access to, it can become your magic silver bullet that you can do it to, uh, to make changes to. Um, there's a pseudo CMS, which is kind of cool that I had to play around with in the last couple of weeks called Cl Slough Cloud. So essentially how Slough works, it's developed by an agency called Salt Agency. Salt Agency is a UK based um, SEO agency. They're one of the best agencies in the planet. And they're in regards to tech SEO, they're like top notch, like top, top, top notch. Like they're the people like people like us respect. They're like, ooh, what, what else they have coming out of there? We read their case studies and so forth. So they have a pseudo CMS. I should have included screenshots of the actual CMS, but you can um, do, modify very basic things in Cloudflare. So you can rewrite the robots or text. You can do server logging. You can do hreflang. There's also some other things like security settings, A-B testing that you can do, which I am too kind of scared with our current client to play with. But essentially what the job of this CMS does is that it generates a worker code, which is basically a JavaScript file. So you can just say page titles, redirects, all these things that you can. It generates a piece of code and then you can deploy that code to Cloudflare and then that will implement to your website. Uh, it's a pretty seamless process. Uh, with our current client, we're not doing the deployment process just due to security reasons because technically you can take the whole website down with it because you're sitting between the user and the website. But this CMS makes it easy because you don't have to know how to code in JavaScript to make changes on the edge. It, uh, like if you actually look at the rendered code, it's very, very complicated for a non-JavaScript user. Um, even someone like me who's kind of experienced in JavaScript, because I'm not familiar with the syntax of workers and that kind of stuff at an in-depth level, it's even complicated for someone like me. But this, um, you can do modifications from an SEO standpoint that you physically can't do on websites where you have limitations. And it just really helps uh, break all the limitations that I've spent five or six years facing in Shopify. It eliminates a lot of them. You can change the robots of text. All that silly stuff we saw in the robots of text in the beginning, gone. Um, impossible, incorrect server responses, like that page should be a 404. That one isn't. That one should redirect to this one, but you can't redirect in Shopify. That's gone as well. So it helps alleviate a lot of the problems. And you can also do stuff, if you know how to code JavaScript, you can do some more interesting stuff as well, like, you know, caching for Googlebot specifically, um, that, that sort of thing to essentially, if you have a client-side rendered website, you can essentially make it seem like it's server-side rendered, at least to Google, and improves website performance. But it's a really powerful thing that essentially liberates us in any hosted platform, not just Shopify, but any hosted platform can benefit from this. So I'm talking Commerce Cloud, BigCommerce, uh, Squarespace, um, Wix, I don't know what you can do with Wix. You probably have to do something fancy with Wix, but yeah. So that's essentially that. Um, so yeah, that's basically golden bullet. I really was hoping to actually show live examples of it, but we didn't actually implement anything that was like live. The only thing I can show you, but I'm not going to show you because I didn't include this thing was like, 
this change to robots at text with Cloudflare, like a little comment, but that was about it on UAT. But yeah, so ideally, Shopify is actually more suitable as a CMS for smaller websites, honestly. Like a large complex retail website um, isn't suitable because the way the tagging, because the way the robots at text works and the nesting works. Um, like Tony mentioned earlier, you have to ask yourself what the use case is for your platform. Shopify is really good for getting started very quickly. But if you're a large, complicated retail website with different categories, like you have a TV department and a home appliance apartment and a DVDs apartment, very, very difficult to manage that kind of um, information architecture. So you, when you're working with Shopify, work within its limitations, understand its limitations, and only when those limitations work against you, then you have to go at it because it might not be worth it from a resource standpoint because you might spend more time modifying the code or doing a customization that will just be easy to just do a complete rewrite and you know use collections impossible in instead of native filters unless you have a really really well structured game plan uh the app i was hoping you mentioned that was like the um power tools filter app um that does a really good way where you can actually create filters of just all nested collections and you can kind of in, avoid the tagging mechanism entirely for Shopify, which would probably solve most small to medium sized websites without any of the tagging functionality at all, as long as you set up the breadcrumbs properly. Um, and yeah, so, and also just make sure that you customize stuff for the canonical URL and no index. I wish there was an app, maybe I should build an app to just override all the problems with the canonical URL on Shopify. But that's essentially it. One thing I didn't mention that I would have loved to mention, but it's honestly a talk on its own, is actually there's another solution instead of Cloudflare is actually headless. So a possible solution would be to actually go completely headless with Shopify. Headless means that you use Shopify's backend, but your front end is something completely different. So it could be a React front end. It could be a Gatsby front end. It could be a Sapper front end. Uh, which is what I want to build with one day. But the problem with that is that it's very development focused. You, you have to either have access to talented developers and make sure that you design and build a front end for it. So there's always cost. Like the benefit of Shopify intrinsically is that it's fast to take off. Like it's easy to theme with. Um, you, you don't have to pay that much for development resources because they support you and so forth. They have a rich community and app ecosystem. That's the main benefit of Shopify when you're choosing Shopify um, as a platform. So if you're going to go headless, then you might as well go headless with, you know, Contentful or Data CMS or like some of these other more sophisticated platforms like Craft CMS or whatever. And then maybe, and then what's the role of Shopify, honestly, in that particular scenario? So if you're going set headless, um, just make sure that it connects with your ecosystem because it can, it is a good chance it's going to be more complicated than what Shopify is out of the box. So yeah, cool. Uh, if you have any questions, and uh, now's the time to go for it. That was absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> wow. I'm surprised, I'm surprised I got that down in 51 minutes because last time I did this preso, it was a solid two hours. Yeah. And you probably had like someone like like myself just be like, oh, oh, but what about this or what about that? <laughs> yeah. uh, See, this, excellent. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of really wanted uh, to, <laughs> to kind of run this just so that I could um, kind of be present um, for this presentation, because obviously <laughs> I missed it the first round. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Peter. No, I was happy to do it. So, any question? Drink every time Peter says slash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we haven't had any questions um, coming through the live chat, but like, like Enrique says, like exceptionally informational. Um, like, it's just kind of like downloading your brain. Um, you know, cause you've, you've been working on this since 2015, um, and you've yeah. been able to figure out how to do a lot of things that are very custom. Um, but I, of course, like, so I don't see any questions. So therefore that gives me the permission to ask you all of my questions. Yeah. <laughs> all, all time for yourself. Excellent. <laughs> go ahead, Nick. <laughs> um, one of, okay. So I might go back up to the top. I started writing them out, but then I just, um, kind of was lost in the things that you're saying. So um, the question I have, like, decentralized um, product URLs. Now, you mentioned this is, like, you know, this would be really, really good to be able to clean up in the code. Um, you know, for someone with no coding experience, um, you know, is is something like um, the, the, the site that you shared earlier um, that kind of, like, walks you through, like, uh, editing Liquify, 
is that like a good resource to be able to refer back to or um uh, for, so if someone had no like coding experience at all like the cheat sheet for example of editing so is this question more about editing liquid for the first time like you had no experience whatsoever or it's it's literally more about um more about like the decentralized products um so of course like um yeah. like you, you know, everything is canonicalized for the product obviously and yeah. um you were saying like if um there's oh god the i'm trying i'm trying to like remember exactly what you said so like the collections yeah. in front of the product url so like you have slash, yes. product, slash product name yeah. a lot of themes and a lot of themes do it is slash collection slash collection name slash yes. product so you might have slash tv slash the whatever but like you, there's yeah. also like samsung tvs might be a collection or whatever whatever and you might have like yes variations of that so yeah so the thing is that fix is like literally a one-line fix right in okay. code but like if you're not a coder you don't know where to look right like i've I can set like i've sent emails to devs if i didn't have access or how to fix it I, I always tell i haven't looked at the code but i bet you it's this and i say it's that and they'll fix it like i don't even look at the code i say it's Essentially, there's a there's a tag in Shopify, or it's not a tag. It's technically a filter or whatever. It's like called within. So within is a tag called within. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you mind my screen share real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So I'm gonna. Oh, this is actually. I'm gonna have to move this to this. The only thing with screen shares, I don't want to share my screen because it'll become an inception kind of thing. All right. So okay. I'm sharing I a. Cool. So we can all see this little particular screen. So in these filters, this is a filter for strings. So you can see here, this is essentially the fix, right? So it's essentially remove that line here. So, oh, that's really ugly. Let's get this up. Let's get a good zoom. So essentially what this is telling you is that like, get the product URL, but within the collection I'm in, right? So if I'm in the makeup collection, instead of giving me the normal product URL, what it's doing is that it's doing slash collection, slash makeup, slash product, slash Estee Lauder, double wear, SPF 15, whatever, mm. right? So that's what it's doing. So if you see this code in the collection template, you delete everything up to here. It should just be open curly brackets, product.url, close curly brackets, not this part. Get rid of this. Got it? Cool. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, I know. I've seen that so many times, so I know how to tell people. I know exactly what the fix is for that particular one. So, yeah. That's such a good, that's such a good little tip. Um, <laughs> cut to me later looking through, the, <laughs> looking through searching for that code. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, um, let's let's talk about sitemaps. Um, I think this yeah. is kind of like news to a lot of people with um, having externally hosted sitemaps as an option. Um, but as far as like implementation, um, you know, is like, you know, you you mentioned like Screaming Frog. You can basically just crawl a site. Um, and you can, um, you know, auto generate. You can you can generate a sitemap um, by using like um, third party tool or something like that. Is there yeah. any way to like implement maybe some rules um, that will maybe allow for some auto generated sitemaps? Um, no, you'll have to build some kind of application for that. Like it's always easy if you're just solving an edge case. Mm -hmm. It's always easy just to provide a list of URLs and that's your XML file, right? And then you you'll just have to clean it up. For you to build some kind of rules, it depend on your website because, like, the thing is, the, the reason why I created, I'll share with you, Nick, privately. Don't share with everyone else. So this is, <laughs> so this is I, I just shared my private chat with Nick the sitemap. Uh, this for our sub collections for JB Hi-Fi. So essentially, it's a, it's a subdomain of JB Hi-Fi, and it's a particular XML file. It's just a static XML file. It's not even secure, mm. honestly. Google respects it because, like every single, like most of these URLs are actually really, really important. Yeah. Um, hopefully, they're not out of date. The problem is, it, it's and you're right to mention that. Uh, is, well, the last mod data is really weird. What happened there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> that's that's wrong. But like essentially, what's um, it, this is all manually generated, or it was generated with like a quick thing or whatever it was, and that's all that this job needed to do. It's maybe about seven hundred URLs or however many it is, and essentially that's solving the problem that Shopify tags can't be added to the sitemap because mm. it doesn't technically exist, right? That's essentially the problem that I'm that we're solving with that particular one. So like. 
is it possible for you to create an automatically generated one? Yeah, you probably could if you developed the application for it, you had some kind of internal logic for it, but there's no like out of the box solution to my knowledge, like that can easily manage that or maybe run it easily. Like if you want that to be built as a product, I don't know, maybe we'll ask someone to do it and then we'll do it and release it. Yeah. <laughs> but, I just yeah. like to think about like, like how can, how can I like create less work for myself in the future? Like if they were to, um, you know, create new tag pages and things like that. And basically every time we, like that gets created, um, basically that won't exist in the sitemap. So you have to manually crawl it, manually um, get the sitemap and then go in and upload it and then um, resubmit it to Search Console. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, a hard, that's a hard thing, right? Because like, well, this particular example, the tag mechanic, like it, it can, you can have an infinite amount of pages created. You just have to create new collections or new tags and all of a sudden they're, they're there. So because then they're, they're not part of the internal mechanism of the website, they're not like a main page or something that you can add like page titles and meta descriptions to. Mm. They're not easily a, able to add to the a sitemap and some of these you don't want in a sitemap because they could be duplicates. Uh, one variation I had in my old slides, which I deleted, was um, like slash men slash perfume or slash fragrance or slash fragrance slash men. Which one is the canonical URL? Which, like, most websites will have them as individual ones, even though they have the same, they're basically the same page, just in different categories and just different ways of thinking about the IA. So yeah, so like if I would, if it was a massive problem, if I would, if I had like say Gaston's job and I was doing Envato, for example, <laughs> and I had to figure out, okay, theme forest is really complicated and all this kind of stuff, then maybe it might be worth having a developer to have some kind of internal custom CMS to handle this. Like I might use something like, I might use like a custom build of Sanity, for example, which is CMS, which is just used to handle like, the CMS, and then I'll basically use that as a CMS for my sitemap, and then have an API to call the website, build them in, and then maybe have some kind of validation mechanism. But now you're talking about a hypothetical website that doesn't exist for me to like build <laughs> a solution for, which is exciting, but not exactly the purpose of this presentation. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I love, I absolutely love picking your brain. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I now, I now kind of like want to. Um, what was the other questions that I kind of wrote down? I, um, yes. To get to, okay, let's talk. Oh, do you want to? Do you want to ask one, Tony? Um, yeah, not really. Uh, jealous of Metafield because you seem very jealous. Of oh yeah, uh, <laughs> Commerce has no Metafields. It, it has a kind of vague thing in the API, but you can't. Yeah, it's the. Uh, and it came to the rescue for you so many times today. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like essentially Metafields basically is two hundred and uh, sixty-five thousand characters is the limit. So anytime you need a problem solve, there's a way to figure it out. So like you know, I've because like in JB Hi-Fi, we work with the Working Party, who's like probably the best Shopify developers in Australia, or probably in the world, even honestly. Um, so apologies to Gavin from Disco Labs, but like essentially. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, like, you know, when we talk about, like, trying to solve a problem in Shopify, it's always going, well, we could do it in Metafield to have this array and split the array like this and do it like this. So you're essentially dumping data into an array and then splitting it up and then sorting it out to, like, solve a problem. Uh, that solves a lot of things like, oh, how do we do X server side? Well, we could do it with Metafields. Or how do we do this that way with the way we've implemented it? And that's a way to solve. It's such a magical bullet because, like, to me, it's so easy, especially with some, something basic like, oh, I need a no index or I need to change the canonical URL. Like, because Shopify doesn't allow you to change it because every single canonical URL is just the URL itself. But, like, oh, this is a duplicate. This is a problem. I need to resolve it. It doesn't actually allow you to resolve it. So, unless you delete the page and redirect it or something crazy like that. So, essentially, uh, someone's like messaging me on LinkedIn about the slides that, of the presentation. So leave it in the actual YouTube comments, dude. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, so like yeah, Metafields are amazing. They're like they're amazing, but the hack because the problem is they're not native in a way to edit in Shopify, right? Like the only way to edit it in Shopify is to use a third-party app, a weird Chrome browser plugin, or to use that bulk editor, which is very cumbersome and not really easy to use. Like most people and most, and most people don't even know how to get to the Metafields anyway because you have to type in a weird 
query parameter, which yeah. takes like trial and error to get right. And you're like, oh, just write bookmark and then like never lose the URL again. Mm. So yeah. Back up your sites, people. <laughs> Actually, that's another problem. You can't really back up Shopify really easily with stuff like menus and stuff. But that's a different problem. <laughs> yeah. Can, well, can you, can, you can create, you can create like, I guess, like snapshots of a site. Yeah, well, with, that's in regards to products and stuff. But one of the things that's really difficult to back up with Shopify is that link list slash menu. Like that's yeah. actually, I mean, uh, yeah. So like essentially if you have like the before the nested menus happen, the way to do nested menus in the old one was that essentially have one menu point to another menu. So you end up with like 200 menus in a back end. And yeah. you can't. I, is, I either you can't back it up or it wasn't easy to back it up. You have to actually do it in the API or something like that. It was like really, I tried to do it before and it was not successful. I could probably do it now if I can, but I don't. So, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So that's one yeah. of the things. And one of the exciting things is that because Shopify is so big, uh, some of these stuff, it's one of the first candidates for like really exciting stuff with headless. Like it's the only e-commerce platform I'm seeing really exciting stuff in the headless space happening. But I could like right now you can probably Google headless Shopify React, headless Shopify Next.js, headless Shopify View, headless Shopify Nux.js, Gridsome, uh, Spelt, Sapper, all the favorite front end languages and like whatever th third CMS you want to plug into because you probably have a Shopify and then you have your mystery super CMS, which is a modern CMS. So it can be contentful story block, Data CMS, all the all the new kids that everyone loves, and then you have your front end with your language of choice. And then, as soon as you pick a stack, that that will be great. That's exciting to work on, but like you know, we only have one client that's going uh, so, uh, headless in the coming year or so, but they're not in the e-commerce space. So you know, hopefully, more of our clients decide to go that direction because there's so many more exciting seo possibilities with headless websites than there is with oh this is how shopify does things oh this is how wordpress has done things this is how blah blah, blah does things mm. like something that you you as an seo can have input in designing is actually what i find exciting mm. um for anyone out there who's wondering like what are link lists um they can be used for lots of different things um Mike, for for example, like using it um, with like nested navigation stuff like that, um, it's pretty pretty awesome. Pretty, like yeah, pretty pretty simple. I I would like to I'd like it's, to think. <laughs> it's it's really easy these days. Like before, it wasn't, but now you can actually do the nesting, and as long as the code's there, it's really really useful. And yeah, it's it's really really useful. It used to be harder, now it's easier. And Shopify. That's one of the good things about Shopify. It's like it gets better every year. Like, like, I wish I cared about um, SEO, but Toby, the guy who founded Shopify, literally doesn't care about SEO. Like, doesn't does yeah. not care. He thinks Shopify is fine, and that's it. Like, yeah. it, like for him, yeah. SEO is a solve problem for him, which is fine. But like, you know, it's like just give me one day in Toronto. I'll come to your office. I'll fix it for you. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, okay, that weird page thing that you did with the canonical URLs, fix that. That weird thing that you did historically for vendors, fix that. Just give me yeah. a day. I'll, I'll fix it all. But they don't want to. Uh, cool. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned vendors. Like, um, I, it's it's a little bit difficult. Like, if if a business relies on um, like brand relationships, like I've got a client that um, has like a huge amount of revenue that comes from like their relationships with um, like their suppliers. So yeah. um, to be able to like have that. Um, like, you know, pages that are kind of really specifically there for brand visibility, um, like a lot of a lot of it out of the box doesn't really support it. Um, you know, and, and again, like, so you're kind of a bit of legendary for anyone who's not aware, like, um, Peter is very legendary for being able to create clean URLs um, in Shopify. Um, again, with um, that cascading code, and you kind of shared a little bit of what that looks like. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, to be able to do that, like you kind of have to look at um, maybe more of like um, a logic based way that can do that, which is a little bit time consuming. And, um, you know, for, you know, for even people like, yeah, like I, I, I just, I just, I know conceptually how it's, how it happens. Um, but I went down the route of like trying to explain um, basically regurgitating some of the, the things that you've um, been able to teach me with um, Shopify SEO. And um, I was kind of met with blank faces from um, the development part, department. Um, so I think it's something that's, 
maybe like it's like needs to be shown rather than explained. Um, yeah, it's really because like for example, like when like when JB Hi-Fi did something similar, they did their version of what I did in my previous role for JB Hi-Fi. They essentially they didn't even. Uh, consult with me that much they just read my blog because i have a blog post on my personal blog um that went into basically what i did with <laughs> <That'd> be, uh, <laughs> i wish i had that <laughs> See, yeah. Code. Yeah, that's, yeah but that's the one that uh, daniel from prosperity media was like oh i want to look at this blog post from peter did it's going to be like but the problem is like that is like really like that's how i did it and like, I wouldn't do it the same, like if I was starting from scratch, for example, I wouldn't do it the same way because I know like the maintain, like there's other costs to that. There's maintainability costs. And sometimes you can say, well, you know what, is clean URLs honestly that important or is it easy to have something that's easy to redirect or easy to maintain, for example? Like if Peter no longer is around to do something, like fortunately my replacement's a superstar, but if they didn't hire a dev focused marketer, for example, in my previous role, how would they be able to make changes? So like th th those are other considerations to have because like SEO might not necessarily be the most important decision when working on a Shopify website. It might be like, okay, how easy is this to develop it? to develop or is it security concerns for example like working too much with shopify like if shopify gets updated and all of a sudden peter's code doesn't work because like they've depreciated everything which they haven't done but that could happen one day like some of the code could like become oh no we're not going to support this weird for loop logic that he did way back when because we don't yeah. use that version of linklist anymore that's always a risk so you know that kind of stuff can always happen so that's kind of like it's almost like it gets to a point where doing it that way, it might be, that's why I always think headless is a solution. It's like it literally would be easy to just create your own front end at that point. There's like a level of difficulty where it's like, okay, to customize Shopify that extreme, it's it, versus replatforming and just doing your own. Like an example of a headless Shopify website is Koala's website. So if you notice Koala, for example, Koala is a Shopify store. So au.koala.com. But if you go to their category pages, so you go bedroom. Um, oh, there was an example, wasn't there? Uh, hopefully, I'm not wrong about this. I swear they had nesting and stuff on the pages. <laughs> unless, they, unless I like, imagined it or something. I'm pretty sure they were a headless website. But, like, uh, but conceivably, Koala could have done um, the category pages like that. Um, it was either them or it was a different headless Shopify website that did it. But uh, anyway, but like essentially that problem, if you did, if you went headless, for example, that problem solved. Mm. All, all of a sudden you could do that. And actually with Cloudflare, you can actually get rid of that problem as well. If you technically, there's a lot of things you can do with Cloudflare workers where you can technically take a URL and put it somewhere else and make that the new URL location. But that's like way too complicated for Cloudflare to do, to explain as, to me, that's not a solution. That's a fun little workaround that I would mess around with. It's like, here's something you can do with the URLs. So yeah, but, but I, I think you have to be practical with your solutions because just because something is a solution doesn't necessarily mean it's the right one because you can technically get to it, but like the better solution might be easier and it might just even involve getting off Shopify or getting on, getting a different version of Shopify or replatforming Shopify or I don't know. It depends. It depends on the type of websites as well. Because like, I, like Shopify was not really built for large retailers. I, in, in my opinion, it doesn't handle the nesting and categorization needed that you would see. Like for example, in Tony's presentation, like he had, you can see a screenshot of all these categories, and they're all like nested, similar to how Magento does it, for example. And as SEOs, we love that because we love our nested structures. And like, if link lists were like the way you can do collections as well, and it, it was all, it was more married to each other, that would be great. And then the URLs reflected that, but that's not the case of Shopify because Shopify is very set in its URL structures. Mm. So yeah, everyone who's dealt with Shopify URLs go, oh. Like, you know, when my boss, like he, when I talk to him about it, he's like, why does it have to be collections? It's so long, like a slash collection slash whatever. It just takes up so much space. Why can't it just be slash computers? Well, it's so much better to do that, but we can't do that. We have to live <laughs> with it. We'll have to take it up with Toby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, go away, G. Um, okay, so uh, I, might, I might have a couple of questions, I think for maybe like for you know, some introductory kind of like Shopify questions. Um, favorite plugins for structured data implementation? 
Oh, I always quote it myself, but the, the one I recommended was yeah. Jason LB by Eric Davis. Um, it's That's something that you pay for, pay for once, and it just does it all for you. Um, Eric is a very talented Ruby on Rails developer, and he just felt like just developing a Shopify app for fun. And he decided to build, oh, I can do this JSON LD thing. And now all of a sudden, he's like, he's a primary business. So it's great. I like I like it when that happens to people, you know, which is cool. So, yeah. So that's my favorite one with regards to schema. Uh, personally, I like, my personal choice is actually to use meta fields or whatever in that scenario. And just like use many of the ones where that you can build your own JSON LD or if you can code it yourself and just paste it that way uh, personally. But in regards to, but if you ever see my schema, you know that I like to, I like if you looked at the schema, for example, on like Kiana, or if you look at Spotlight, for example, you know that I'm really, really hardcore in the way I structure stuff. I don't just do stuff for Google. I like to do, <coughs> like, I mean, you were you were at my presentation, Nick, like last uh, last time we had the schema talk. Like, like <laughs> I go, I go pretty hardcore with like item page, collection page, and then all the main entities and all that. I like linking them all up. And like I and I like doing that all with like, that's why I like doing it myself. But yeah. for people, but for people who want to get rich results, then yeah, I recommend using JSON LD just because it will save you a lot of trouble in case there's some weird markup. And I would, you know, like I personally prefer microdata, but unfortunately, it's just so uh, brittle to scope issues. But yeah, JSON LD for uh, SEO by Eric Davis, Little Stream Software. <laughs> awesome. Um, favorite, um, uh, favorite, uh, yeah. What, what, what's your favorite app for, um, faster navigation? Oh, um, I'm going to look up, I, I keep say, saying it, but like, what was it called? It was, I've got it open here. I'm going to look it up so I get the name right. So the app I really, really like is by, uh, power tools. So it's called filter menu. So it's really, really powerful because essentially you control the visibility. So you create stuff like product groups. I really should include a screenshot. I can't believe I forgot to include a screenshot of it. But it's, it's essentially you create stuff that's called like product groups. So you might have like, you know, your top level categories and they're visible in all versions of collections. So instead of doing the tag, like there's, you can do the tagging method, for example, for these things. Um, and, or you can just do it all as collections. So it would basically, you can remove the tagging functionality entirely and just stick to, um, <laughs> thanks Nick, passage. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah, so essentially you can, so the main advantage of that is that essentially you can categorize it either as all collections. So you can just have no tagging whatsoever and you have like basically pseudo tagging, but it's all collections automatically generated for you, which works better from a URL standpoint. Um, or you can do some fancy stuff with tagging and then have nested tagging and stuff for various things that's filters. So uh, it's the, the thing is called pa uh, filter menu by power tools. Power tools provides a lot of the bulk editing things. So bulk editing for tags and so forth. And from what I've seen, it's really, really good. Um, and it's also really, really good within the way it implements um, automatic um, page titles and descriptions, for example, because there's actually a little bit of logic. I, I haven't dug into the code that much, but it actually did a pretty sensible logic for some tags. So if I just tag something as like, you know, as protein, it just said protein drinks, for example, that kind of thing, like automatically without, whereas that stuff took me forever to like properly map out in my previous role, which works perfectly, but like you can't have that burden when you're doing agency work, for example, because I'm not going to spend four years on one client. Well, I might actually, some of our clients are pretty old, but like it's, yeah, yeah but like that's the thing, right? The timelines are very different and the deliverables are very different in regards to what you have to provide as an agency. So yeah, that's my favorite faceted navigation app because you can do things in multiple ways and it's probably the best if you purely care about seo you can just stick to collections don't even bother with tags because that way you have 100 percent control of all the page tiles and meta descriptions you don't have to worry about your crawl budget being like blown up um but yeah and also if you have a smaller website as well it's just way easier like i'm so jealous of smaller websites <sighs> any, any more questions I think um, I think it's like eight eight twenty twenty eight p.m. Um, so no, I, I might just it. have <laughs> one final question just to cap it off. Um, and I think um, I, again, this is kind of like aimed at people who um, are kind of 
you know, SEOs who are working with Shopify, what is your biggest challenge to um, getting clients to really understand the value of um, some of these some of these changes that might require to have de development inputs um, or, you know, even to have like um, an SEO kind of like spend the time to work through this? Um, well, it's really tricky for me to answer that question because the people who uh, I work with know I'm the Shopify expert. So it's really <laughs> difficult to communicate the message. Um, so, okay. So like in regards to like some of our other clients, like, for JB Hi-Fi is probably the only one who would be even close with like getting SEO. It's like when SEO is kind of fine, I guess it's, the, it's like almost where the value is. It's like, oh, is it worth doing X, Y, and Z? It's only when they really, like they really have an internal, like, you know, for example, like, hey, PlayStation 5 is no longer on the first page. It was, yeah, you've got duplicate content. Well, we've got to do something. It's like, well, if you want, you have to do this and this. Oh, no, but we can't change what the manufacturer does. Well, blah, blah, blah. well, do you want to be in Google? Yes or no? And then, like, you do the work. And then now we're number two behind the our official website. So, like, but those kind of stuff isn't really exclusive to Shopify. Like, I mean, JB Hi-Fi have all the contacts to Shopify. They have all the contacts to the best Shopify development agency. They have... Uh, access to us who know Shopify pretty well from an SEO standpoint. So like they have all the resources available to them. It's just their, their internal mechanisms for implementing change is all varied upon other things. Like, you know, developers might be too busy now overhauling the navigation or implementing performance enhancements or like, you know, the res it's more of a question of resourcing. Whereas other people who like have smaller websites who want to do Shopify SEO, it's really hard for me to communicate that because they literally say, Peter, here you go, do your thing. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They just they basically give me full access, tell me to do my thing, I do my thing, and it's fine. So, like, it's really difficult for me to answer that question specifically just based on the type of clients who I work in Shopify for. All know I'm the Shopify expert, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for all question. of you other plebs who don't have that kind of um, <laughs> amazing reputation, very well um, earned reputation, um, yeah, just understand the value of um, of the fix. And if it is required, um, and if they really do want to go after that, and they will, you know, basically, if they if they get uh, on board and see the same value, um, they will eventually sit down and be like, okay, well, how do we actually look at tackling this? Yeah, great. Yeah, Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, keep going. <laughs> it's like exclusive to Shopify, like communicating the value of SEO. Mm -hmm. Like you just have to communicate. Like, okay, this is what it takes to do for you to compete in SEO. Here's the value it could create. And it's very difficult for, like there's two different people. There's people who've never seen SEO value before. Like they only know brand value and they like they don't actually understand the value of non-brand traffic. And then there's the people who are just kind of like, well, you know, we're this brand. We don't really care that much about SEO because it's not that important. And of course you have the other people who like know SEO is and they spend as much money as they want on SEO, which is why they succeed. It's almost a self-fulfilling prof uh, prophecy yeah. at that point as well. So, yeah, every, everyone's different. Everyone perceives it differently. And, you know, who knows? Maybe they hire different marketing managers or heads of e-commerce who have different philosophies. And that is usually the driver to change businesses because you as an external agency or as a consultant, for example, you can drive some kind of change, but like your position will be just based on like who's advocating for you internally for that uh, for that company. Whereas if the person who's internal in that company is advocating, like they really believe S success in SEO is success for them as well, then they will fight for you and they'll provide resources for you as well. So have happy clients. We love you. What a great way to end it. Thank you so much for that, um, Peter. That was uh, as usual. Absolutely phenomenal. And I know that there's going to be a lot of people who are probably going to rewind, watch it again, probably put it in slow-mo and take a ton of notes and um, do a lot of um, freeze framing on some of your slides just to kind of like, you know, think about, um, you know, how they can implement some of this stuff for themselves. Um, thank you so much, Tony. Um, thank you so much, Peter. Um, as one final way of, um, you know, uh, to the, to the, like, like last tail end people that are on this thread. Um, how can we find you after this? Um, the best way to reach out to me is probably LinkedIn. That's uh, probably the platform I'm most active on. I do have a website, but I haven't updated in a while because, yeah. but like, yeah, uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter, but I don't use Twitter that much except Nick's been using it a lot and then got everyone else to use Twitter again now. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like, 
the one who uses it again. So, yeah. So, like, on Twitter, you can reach out to me. Um, my username is at Inkovic. So, I-N-K-O-V-I-C. It's – don't ask me why. I chose it as a DeviantArt username a long time ago, and then that's my username for everything now. Um, and my name is Peter Machinkovic. So, if you can just look that up. Um you, my name's there. Just Google that. There's not many Peter Machinkoviches, not at least in Australia. There's other Machinkoviches, but uh, not Peter. So, yep, just send the LinkedIn connection. Just make sure that you're not trying to sell me anything that I don't care about. And then, yeah, that'd be great. But I've got all these high tier links. <laughs> don't you want to buy? <laughs> yeah. if, if, uh, you want, if, you, if you want to sell high quality links, it has to be at least DA40 and then what? Maybe 10 outbound. <laughs> 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 uh, awesome um, and of course you know tony i know you said it before but um you know i'd love love to to uh, you to tell everyone how we can find you after this yeah well i'm, I'm similar that uh, my name's unique enough so you can just google tony mccreeth and you'll find me uh probably twitter's the best one i'm not much of a linkedin guy and if you are on big commerce go to their uh the big commerce community uh, i'm always on there and um, great place to ask big commerce questions absolutely thank you so much for your time and if you're you're here um please um hit that subscribe button hit the um the like button and um click the bell for notifications um we're hopefully going to be continuing this cms series um with a deep dive into magento and hubspot next um so as soon as i get the confirmation um that will be going out and um, hopefully we'll have like all the images and things like that to be able to show everybody <laughs> who's going on. Apologies, Peter and Tony. Um, but you know what? It is what it is. It is a very, very interesting time at the moment. And we're all just, you know, doing the best that we can. All right. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Um, really, really appreciate it. Stay safe, stay indoors and wear, wear a mask. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, guys. See you all. Thanks all. Bye. <laughs>